Ah, 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 Ja počnem. Sem čugovanjo, ne moraš nešto vrči, to tam oni. Znači, mi ne diramo mikrofone, ali tako? Ne. Dobro jutro svima, good morning everybody. Dear friends, colleagues, professors, students, we are about to start our third Formation Literacy and Democracy Conference. We're 
doing it in collaboration with the University of Hildersheim for three years in a row. And we are so glad that we managed to have this continuity of our uh, fruitful cooperation in which we are trying to bridge different aspects of uh, information and media literacy, digital learning, technology and democracy, and uh, uh, burning issues uh, over the intersections in, uh, in the realm of the infrastructures that encompass our behavior and our living as a private persons, as professionals, and as a citizens, actually. So in this year's conference, we are trying to teach concepts and evaluation in times of information disorder. And this is the uh, framework in which we are going to set all our presentations today. And before I tell you a little bit more about uh, the history of our cooperation, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Saad Turcalo, Dean of the Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Sarajevo, to welcome you. And uh, so, Professor Turcalo. Thank you, Mario. Uh, good morning, everyone, the panelists, the participants who are following us online and live in this room. Welcome to the third Information, Literacy and Democracy International Conference that enables dialogue over igniting questions of deliberative practices in a platform society. It could be named the tactical resistance of collaborative partnerships in information and media literacy, an academic maneuver to initiate exchanges of interactions, talks, presentations, workshops, and networking, something that University of Hildesheim recognized and supported from the beginning of this DAAD funded program. And this way we did not have to adjust program ex exclusively for the academic community, but to engage its critical skills responsible for transgressing barriers in attitudes and approaches that prevent partnership of civic and public nodes. Faculty of Political Sciences at the University of Sarajevo is therefore immensely appreciative for the continuity of this academic exchange with the University of Hildesheim. Our Institute for Social Science Research in a collaborative partnership with German colleagues, namely Professor Dr. Thomas Mandel and Professor Joachim Griesbaum organized international online conferences Students from Bosnia and Herzegovina participated in information literacy and inter intercultural dialogue together with students from Serbia, Montenegro, India, United States, Austria, and Germany. And they had a chance to be invited to information sciences and uh, literacy summer schools and more. In that context, I'm really glad that you gathered together again to provide us thoughts on how information professionals, politics, and civic development correlate in perspectives of media and information literacy education. Moreover, to ask how is a form of automated knowledge production seen in the light of social organizations. Since this techno-libertarianism has heralded all solution to societal ills, aren't we in need for more opportunities, as this one really is, to negotiate over our perspectives that could steer up even a meta-political awareness in our scientific communities. For this reason, I welcome you again, and I hope that your learning and teaching practices would also deepen interdisciplinary ties in communities that are facilitating information literacy and democracy. At the end of my uh, remarks, I would also like to thank the entire team of the Institute for Social Science Research of the Faculty of Political Science. And today I start with Mario Hibbert, who is our affiliate actually from the 
faculty of philosophy, but we consider him uh, like a part of our family at the university, at the faculty of political science, then to Amir Weizovich, the head of the social science institute, who is currently in uh, Abu Dhabi on a conference very similar to this one. Then uh, to Amina, who is doing this great as a job, not only technical, but this was very as a qualitative and very actually uh, a very important uh, nature. Uh, Sanel Huskic, and of course, our uh, guy for this all technical issues, Riyadh, for having organized all of this, and not only this conference, but many actually workshops and everything actually I mentioned in, in this, in, in my introductory speech. I wish you all a fruitful discussion and to deliver our academic community, civic society, and even those who actually are shaping our strategies on media and information literacy inside that could actually uh, shape the, their responses to the information overflow that we are having in our society today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Turcalo. Uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, you mentioned our dear colleague Emir Vajzovic, uh, who is uh, uh, my closest uh, uh, colleague uh, at the university, and we uh, have been doing uh, uh, projects uh, with UNESCO, uh, local office, uh, uh, for already for five years and uh, uh, we miss him a, a lot today but he he's coming tomorrow so uh, uh, the team will be complete very soon uh, <clears throat> now i'd like to give a word to uh, professor thomas Mandel from university of hildersheim uh, and uh, i have to say that uh, uh, we managed to have a really really close relationship with the University of Hildesheim. Our students have been uh, visiting uh, uh, the Department of Information Sciences, uh, summer schools, we, uh, as you said, from the uh, Dean's speech, uh, also our students had a chance to participate in online programs together with uh, students from India, from uh, United States, uh, Austria. And uh, uh, it goes really, uh, 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 easy somehow to to establish these uh, 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 connections because uh, somehow we managed to bridge uh, 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 the, the the burning issues and topics from information science and political science perspective and it uh, goes uh, 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 very well last three years so I uh, uh, I'm, I wish that we continue our cooperation and have uh, 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 another information literacy and democracy conference like this uh, 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 very soon. So, Thomas. Thank you, Mario, for the nice talk. Thank the Dean also for the introductory words, very nice. And it feels good for me to come back to Sarajevo and to the region, very nice to continue this cooperation and having it, as Mario said, already on established on such a stable uh well, stable context and to be able to continue this for the third year now in a row uh, we have done this third year in a row now with the dad support we have also done some other uh, uh activities we managed uh, last year to get or this year actually to get a, a fund for student exchange in the erasmus plus program so we're also very happy that this networking can continue and then we can uh, strengthen these ties with the University of Sarajevo. University of Sarajevo definitely is a key player in the science in the region here in scientific terms and is really important so it serves also for us as a hub to connect to other uh, partners here in information science in the region now just we have guests here from several other universities so it's really a excellent opportunity for us. 
Um, I'd like to give a very small present to the team to thank, uh, just to make the small Christmas sweet uh, from Germany, to make the even more memorable the, uh, the, this conference uh, also when we get back home. And uh, I also would like to thank all the organizers here who really did an excellent job. And like last year, the technical setup is wonderful and we can just come here, relax, sit here and start talking. Everything is taken care of. Uh, mainly thanks to Mario Hibbert and Professor Emir Reisovic, who will come tomorrow as we sit. And of course, to a uh, huge thanks to Emina Adilovic, who really does an excellent job. She's worked so much for the University of Hildesheim. I thought it's adequate to already give her some adequate work clothes here with the Lord ball. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's also my great pleasure to announce now that uh, last week the DAD is really seems to be convinced by our work and is has granted a new project for next year. So I hope that we can uh, continue. We will do this in the form of a summer school or autumn school. So uh, please, uh, again, uh, spread the word to your students and in the network, we can really have a more, even more uh, yeah, student uh, engagement and we will continue that. So it's really wonderful for three years. In the first year, we got a grant for mobility and the crisis came. So it was not easy, but we managed despite the crisis to keep it up and to increase the presence and decrease the digital part but we managed to work already three years and hopefully next year we can uh, do it really in the, uh, the physical space again, right? Yeah, uh, for the conference, of course, the main issue is the scientific goal. So I'm really glad that Mario and with some help from us has put together such a nice program that is very interdisciplinary that shows how information literacy is important and uh, that skills are absolutely necessary and uh, we will discuss how can we strengthen these skills how can society benefit and with that we see that information science research on information literacy really is also uh, relevant for the society on a daily basis we uh, are confronted with problems of information literacy fake news uh, uh, political influence in the spheres in the political sphere so it's really really necessary to do this work and uh, we are also impressed by the great work that has been done here with the civil society with players in the civil society especially at the university of sarajevo with the unesco world culture uh, with the unesco uh, group with the canton of sarajevo with the school uh, uh, plans and introducing information literacy concept into curricula the group here has done really an amazing job to really make scientific and uh, academic ideas alive in the civil society. Yeah, and uh, it, this is also very important uh, for us at the University of Hildesheim, where we have recently started a degree, digital social science, where we integrate social science, idea, political science, social science, uh, uh, sociology with information science and with information literacy, education and other issues to really connect these two fields. <clears throat> now with that, I think I hand back to Mario now for the next few words and soon we will be happy to start the conference. Please, Mario. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted also just to mention a couple uh, things, uh, uh, how it actually uh, started. And I would like to uh, express my thankfulness for, to Professor Tatiana Paracelsic uh, because uh, she has been the initiator of, uh, uh, of this cooperation, let's say, because uh, uh, in 2019, we were with our students uh, from Sarajevo participating at the uh, summer school in Osijek uh, on information sciences, uh, where I actually met Thomas and uh, uh, we started developing our ideas that uh, 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 happened to be uh, 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 distributed last uh, three years, and uh, uh, I remember that the first uh, first uh, uh, idea was to have uh, 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 colleagues from University of Hildesheim 
in uh, uh, 2020. But of course, pandemic uh, uh, disrupted our plans, uh, uh, but, but it actually didn't stop us. Uh, uh, we organized uh, two online conferences with pre-recorded video uh, talks, and then uh, 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 we continued with uh, with our uh, concepts and programs uh, mainly focusing on uh, uh, how information professionals uh, and librarians are uh, coping with the uh, with the uh, with the issues uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, digital disorder so uh, this interdisciplinarity which is fundamental in in information sciences is actually also the opportunity to involve much more actors into the topics that we are trying to tackle and uh, as i most of the time say to my students there is nothing more political than organizing information so uh, uh, this is the, the nature of our uh, uh, working together which which uh, definitely uh, uh, goes uh, uh, along our academic but also our civic duties to uh, 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 point our thoughts to the questions that uh, 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 that society definitely is in need. So that was the also idea for uh, uh, having uh, uh, Professor Vladan Yoler here with us, uh, our keynote speaker, and I uh, should say my uh, colleague and friend uh, uh, who has an uh, astonishing uh, uh, career, I would say. Uh, because he's a, a, a kind of a researcher who is uh, uh, visualizing his uh, uh, scientific research. And uh, he managed to somehow open the black boxes of uh, 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 digital infrastructures. So uh, 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 I had a chance to, to uh, uh, meet him for the first time in uh, Kotor, Montenegro, uh, or during the Digital Born Media Carnival, which was really huge event uh, 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 and uh, kind of atypical because the, the, all the lectures and presentations uh, were held uh, uh, in the evenings. So we were uh, uh, discussing different issues uh, 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 very late uh, until the midnight. So. Uh, uh, I, I realize how important it is uh, uh, to expose uh, uh, ourselves as academics, but also uh, uh, students to uh, different uh, uh, approaches and different perspectives uh, uh, in, in this field. Uh, uh, and I'm really so glad that uh, Vladan managed to come to Sarajevo. Uh, actually, from from the United States, where he recently. Uh, 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 had a chance to uh, uh, also somehow present his uh, 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 cartography, his maps in uh, uh, New York MoMA Museum. So uh, I can give a couple of uh, lines also about uh, uh, Vladan. Vladan Yeller was born in 1970. Seven in Novi Sad is he's a Share Foundation's co-founder and professor at the new media department at the University of Novi Sad Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, he's leading a Share Lab, a research and data investigation lab for exploring different technical and social aspects of algorithmic transparency, digital labor, exploitation, invisible infrastructures, black boxes, and many other contemporary phenomena on the intersection between technology and society. Vladimir's work is included in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Design Museum in London, and the permanent exhibition of the Arts Electronica Center in Linz. His work has been exhibit exhibited in more than 100 international exhibitions, including institutions and events such as so I don't uh, 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 I have to mention uh, 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 all, but uh, uh, the thing is, and uh, uh, that's how I will sum up all uh, of our <laughs> introductory speech. I'm really glad that we have a chance to uh, not just to combine, but to uh, uh, really uh, uh, um, experience lecture in which art and technology uh, uh, has been exposed in such a political uh, deeply political 
uh, and I would say, uh, 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 ideological way in terms that hegemony of the uh, uh, the digital realm, realm now <clears throat> also provokes us and asks us what happens when we take a distance and when we somehow get sober of the, the digital dizziness in which we all dwell. So uh, welcome Vladan and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. This is a really wonderful introduction and, and it's Really, really pleasure to to be here as always. I'm I'm a big fan of Sarah and I always enjoy being here and, and spending time with, with people and, and and always learning something new. So uh okay, can can we have a, a, a visuals from this screen or okay? So I'm not, not so sure that, that technically this is going to to, to function perfectly today so i'm going to rely more on uh, my entertainment skills as a human being and hopefully this will work and uh, so what we are seeing here in the map it's a bit blurry but but never mind so this is something that's called anatomy of an ai system and this is the 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 map that, that, that basically i did together with kate crawford in 2018 and unfortunately I'm now like for four years like a slave of that map. That means that I need to go around and 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 talk all the time about the same thing. But <laughs> but yeah, this is how it goes. But the thing is, somehow yes, this map really represents some kind of like let's say now almost eight years of of uh, research that really didn't started with this idea of creating big black you know sometimes even more crazy maps of, of of some kind of planetary scale systems it really started with the idea of trying to understand what is going on behind device that i'm using so it started with a screen so like the first step it's trying to understand like what's going on like in this first step behind so okay there is some kind of router what what is behind the router what is happening in this like one part of the second when i press the button on on the computer on the keyboard what's going on then and and basically step by step we were like trying to find the different ways and some some of those ways this is like the 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 really weird situation is that like we speak about i don't know like uh, digital literacy or we speak about technology in education we speak about internet in many different ways but we don't have any idea how it really works and 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 this is like really strange thing because like this kind of infrastructure this invisible infrastructure that exists between us so for example here in this very moment this this so I, I loaded this map that is on some website that it's called Prezi that who knows where this Prezi is. so I'm like taking like thousands and thousands of, of packets and bringing here and then from this computer it go through the cable there but then it's like uh, transported to zoom and over the zoom it's projected here so in this same moment like thousands and thousands and millions of packets are flowing in order to to mediate this really simple relation that we have here and 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 this is what i was like really you know like interested to to try to understand like how this really works and and so we we try to find a different way how to investigate those layers of infrastructure so for example the first one was trying to understand the networks you know how they how they look like you know so we, we try to find the different tools how to measure how to 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 feel the networks how to feel the network infrastructure so for example this is the image of one internet service provider in serbia i think it's called orion and then and then and then in the moment when we see this this like uh, image like okay well, what the, what's the meaning of that image what's what are those like white things there like how we can read those because like within this infrastructure within these images that we are seeing we can read different forms of powers you know we can we can uh, uh so for example i think there is like for from my point of view there is like in each of those dots that we see here on on this 
map, and each of each of those dots have the same power. It's a power to to block, to stop, to censor, power to to uh, to uh, see, basically to see what what is flowing through this point. And the third power is power to make those flows, data flows faster and slower. And and so, for example, those are some kind of power that exists within those networks, within those dots. But there is those kind of relations are also creating different kinds of political and social relations and, and many different things that, that we cannot understand. And the thing is, usually we cannot understand because usually what we are presented with in our lives, it's just like some kind of like marketing idea about the internet. That it's some kind of cloud that I don't know what, it's great, it's going to turn our life, I don't know what. But we, we barely... Uh, speak and think about materiality of the internet and i speak about materiality of the internet not because i am some kind of marxist who want whatever because i think that materiality is may, maybe a key to understand some of those power relations if i understand how those cables are connected if i understand how how the, where are those infrastructure to which law under which law are those data centers or cables or whatever then maybe I will be able to 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 have an insight into into this kind of hidden forms of of powers that that, that exist within this infrastructure. And then if so, if we go step by step, so so first step it's trying to understand the networks. Then the second step it's trying to understand what's going on in those data centers. So then we are speaking about. Uh, uh, algorithms and 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 and, and different kinds of like. Uh, uh, mathematical equations uh, artificial intelligence or whatever uh, this is another level of untransparency no so this is also something that we don't know and it's really hard to to investigate and it's really important to understand here that, that all of those things that i'm explaining here are coming from the position of let's say something that i like to call counter cartography so usually cartography it's coming from the position of power in which like you know, this is my kingdom, this is my company, this is like my organizational chart. And counter cartography is trying to understand the organizational chart of someone else. It's trying to understand the power relation that exists in, in some territories that you don't own. So it's it's kind of counter the idea of, of traditional uh, um, cartography. And then why I also think like cartography as a thing, it's really important because like uh, we need to understand those uh, spaces. We need, and, and some of them, it's really hard to understand, you know, like, for example, if we speak about algorithmic frontiers, if we speak about some kind of statistical spaces, it's like really beyond our, our uh, possibility to, to understand. And, and sometimes those like uh, investigations in which we are you know, like we, we try to build the different tools in order to extract, to give us hints about some of those places. Uh, uh, the only way to see them is to, to visualize them in a way. So to take this data and to transform this data into image and then to try to understand what is the meaning of, of this image. You know? So this is some, some kind of like a journey. So for example, in this journey now, we are in this data center and we are trying to understand like those... Uh, algorithmic flows and this is another dimension of complexity so it's like really important to understand this is some kind of n-dimensional space of of like many many layers of complexities so technology itself like devices are so complex then the networks are really complex then the algorithmic processes are really com complex and all of them represent different forms of layers of untransparencies that are hidden from our views, no? So for example, if we just speak to, to about these algorithmic processes, I have another map that is called Facebook Algorithmic Factory. This one that I also try to draw for like two, three years, it try to understand the process of extraction. You know, it's it, it basically is trying to understand the factory, how this factory works. Because like, if we speak about Facebook and Google and all of them, together i like to think about them as a factories just not to make them fetishize them what they do they are creating money you know so if, if they work as a factory i would like to understand how this factory works and 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 also to understand what is the 
the resource they're exploiting. I want to understand the labor that is employed there, and I want to understand what is the product. You know? And so, for example, this map, it's a, some one of the probably only representation of this algorithmic process. It's really unprecise. It's like from 2016, eight, 16 probably. But it's still only map of algorithmic process within Facebook. And that's completely crazy because like what was some kind of promise to us with GDPR is that all of those processes are going to be transparent and then we will have a tools to see them. But basically that, that doesn't exist. No, 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 it didn't happen, no? So we tried like here, like spend like two, three years, you know, in a way like trying to, to find the different ways how to, you know, scrape interfaces, how to analyze different kind of patterns, how to do like a lot of strange and crazy things in order just to understand the flow how the information is being extracted, how this information is being processed, what kind of algorithms are there, and at the end, how all of this is transformed into the final product that basically it's 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 us, no, or our profile. So, and then the interesting thing here, when when working on this map, I realized that okay, this is like really I was really struggling, and this is something that we will speak in in uh, in this new extractivism. Uh, it's like, okay, if, if, if we think about this as a factory, no? So what is position of me as a an user? And I really ha hate the word user, but I'm not so sure what to use uh, any other word, like a worker or something like this. Because like it, it really doesn't explain our relation uh, with, with, with this like platforms or, or those factories. The main problem, you know, usually when we think about this relation between resource labor and the and the and the product usually they, there is like you know the resource it's wood and then the labor it's a person who know to do something with wood and then the product is a toy you no know? but here the the funny thing is like the we can think about us as a human beings as a users uh also as a as a resource because we are the 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 thing that is being extracted you know, and so how we are being extracted, basically whatever we do, every hour move, every hour, like, you know, whatever we do online is being tracked. So we are, we live in some kind of surveillance capitalism world in which we are surrounded by thousands and thousands or, or millions of different kinds of sensors or different kinds of triggers that are collecting constantly information about us. But if we think so we there we are object of extraction. You no, know, something, something, somebody it's extracting something from our bodies, our minds, our behavior, and so on. No? So in a way, we are resource. We are the same thing as a as a oil coal. When they say the data, it's no new gold or oil. Data about what? You know, like then you, you can ask, like, okay, if, if this is a resource, who is making this resource? And then you can think about yourself also as the one who is producing the resource so and but then anyway we are the resource for these factories we are also we are also the workers in this factory and this is also the strange thing if you think about like this kind of theories of immaterial work from like 2000 saying like every time when we write something online or on facebook google whatever we are basically working for them and it's true we are creating like content we are duh, 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 so that means we are also workers and in the same time we are also a product and that's like really, really in, in that sense, this kind of new situation, new relations that I'm like really interested in somehow breaking this triangle of, of resource labor product, because we are all of those in those positions in the same time within this really strange, untransparent uh, factory. And then the thing is, okay, there was like, I don't know, few years ago it was like really trendy this topic of algorithmic transparency you know so it's like okay we are going there we are going toward we want to do that but what 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 even if we have all of those mathematical equations so someone give us all the 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 algorithms that exist within facebook what we can do with that because then we will need to try to understand to translate those mathematical equ equations to to society because what is happening to us it's the different kind of statistical and mathematical equations or, or uh, statistical processes are being implied on society as a rules 
so how i can understand like what is the impact of all of those like uh, uh, algorithms and equations on society even if i know the 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 exactly what this this algorithm is and then the problem is that all of them are functioning in the same time so it's not just like one algorithm it's hundreds and hundreds of algorithms that are basically defining at the end what you are seeing on the screen or what you are going to be presented with and and, and basically creating this kind of like a constant reality show uh, uh, that is basically directed by different algorithms and statistical processes so this is like some kind of like a let's say intro into into that story and then by doing all of those investigations so for example uh this is just the story about as i said it's some kind of multi-dimensional space no uh so to go back to this anatomy of an air system this one became so i think so visible because it it, it created some kind of new relation created because usually what we are doing we are discussing relation between human beings and technology society and technology us 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 all the time how this uh, technology is influencing my i don't know view or whatever but what this map introduced is basically new actor in this triangle it's like relation between uh, um, us human beings technology and nature because like it's not just about extraction of of our labor it's not just about us all the time it's also in this process of extraction there is also a nature because we if we think and this is something that i really uh, uh, um, give a credit to to UC Parika who opened to me with his book Geology of Media this idea of of like not seeing because all of those things about like all of those drawings and stuff like this that you're seeing here is basically some kind of a you know idea of this Marshall McLuhan of extension of our senses no so trying to understand like this extension because okay now there is a screen this screen it's extension of my eyes and then there are cables and there is data center all of those are extensions of our senses but you you see parika is speaking about extension of the earth so thinking about media as extension of the earth and and that means that you need to start with the metals because you know all of those technologies all of those like infrastructure that we are seeing here like 10 20 years ago it was some kind of rocks and different types of metals no and then somehow those rocks and metals were combined into the objects that we are using today and then in like 100 years or 50 years or 20 years will become a, again rocks and metals new some kind of geological layer and this is what this map tried to to mix together so basically if, if you start from here you will start with geological layer and then periodic system of elements and then if you follow all of those elements so for example in each of those devices in mobile phones and stuff you have like a th three quarter of periodic system of element and each of those elements tell its own story no? so if you start to follow those stories you will you will finish in some kind of really fractal storytelling but within this fractal storytelling it's a story about extraction it's a story about destruction of nature it's just because like we are starting in the mines of in congo in china in like some places that you really don't want to be you know work working because like you know it's uh, toxic and 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 basically it's a story about destruction no and and story about inequality because if, if we start starts from the bottom of this story the people there like earn like one dollar per day and then person the top it, it, now we cannot anymore even to tell like how much they earn because now they became completely crazy like this guy who, who bought the twitter now for example now that, that amount of money that they possessed and they earn per day it's it's really abstraction no so but we need to think about even if it's a construction we need to think about that within this supply chains exist inequality that it's like one to 300 million and this is something that we should ask ourselves every day is it really okay that within one process hidden behind this device we should have those kind of equalities inequalities being embedded that that people all the people who contribute to this 
are differently valued and, 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 and paid. So to make things short, <laughs> uh, because now we are going to see a cartoon, a uh, movie, or whatever. What, huh? You have your time until you learn. What? <laughs> I tell you everything in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so the, the story goes, uh, it's not, we should, we should try to think multidimensionally about those relations. It's not just us and technology, it's also us, technology and nature. It's, it's also, we should, we should try to think and, and, and see those materialities of, of those infrastructures because they can help us to understand those relations, no? So on one side, we have this kind of process of extraction of, of uh, our bodies and minds and, and data that we produce. But also on the other side, we should not forget this is like classical, you know, colonial relation of like extraction of nature. And, and we are seeing this, for example, now in Serbia, we have this kind of issue with a uh, uh, um, lithium mine. Is it going to be open or not? And who is going to own that? And, and who is going to pay this ecological price for that? You know, like people who live around and so on, so on. So those are these kind of like uh, uh, multidimensional relations that exist within those spaces. Now we will try to see the 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 uh, the the one animation. So so basically, it started when I when when I started this like six seven years ago. I really believed in in lawyers and technical experts. That's a weird. Kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Really, that's <laughs> not maybe the best. Thing. Well, never mind. Because I, I was thinking, okay, if we have enough technical knowledge to investigate those infrastructures, to investigate those spaces, then we will be able to see, you know, and then we will be able to create new kind of, you know, some kind of legal. Uh, 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 um, systems of protection for people we will be able to participate in some kind of like changing the different laws or whatever you know some kind of policy making or whatever but more and more i was going deeper in, into those like spaces and and let's say you know like going deeper into those like black boxes and trying to see them from different angles i realized that 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 for me it's like really hard to uh give an answer to to meaning of those relations and systems because like technical knowledge was not able to give me the the answer on why it would it, it just give you an answer how no how something something is working but just seeing how something is working so for example if we go here and this is how something is working okay but but the the most interesting question here it's why why what's the what's the reason behind of this you know and and then the 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 so i realized also some kind of legal analysis far away from giving for being able to to give me any kind of like tools to understand why you know and and i more and more went into into let's say critical media theory, art, and, and philosophy as a potential, let's say, lenses for seeing those spacing and try, spaces and trying to understand the meaning of those uh, uh, relations. And, and because I, I think like if we are seeing those complexities, if we are seeing those like black boxes, I think it's really important that we see them from many different angles. And for me, you know, each discipline is giving you another lens to see the, the shape of this some kind of like uh, abstract object. You know? So, for example, you know, as I said, like maybe cyber forensics and technical analysis can give me an answer like why, uh, how, but then like philosophy or maybe media theory will, will give me an answer why. And, 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 and in a way, like by creating those 
those maps, I, I for example, spent like one or two years like uh, uh, investigating and drawing and stuff like this. And then I spent the same amount of time trying to give an, trying to read and to understand by myself what is the meaning of this map and to transform this into some kind of essay. Because usually what I'm doing, I'm, I'm publishing, uh, and this is also interesting, like publishing where, in, in which form. Uh, uh, publishing usually in parallel those drawings and maps together with, with, with text and with an essay. And, and I never publish, and this is the question, like where this kind of activity, where this as a product belong? Does it belong to the field of science? Does it belong to the field of art? Does it belong to the field? It doesn't belong to any of those fields and it can also be do some kind of like, a, you know, flirting with all of them. And, 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 and in a way, so this is like an interesting position. I think for me was always to try to be in between, uh, in between those spaces, you know, because it gives me some kind of flexibility because, for example, if if we we go back, if 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 I if I was, you know, if I, if I wanted to play the game of of writing scientific papers, this will never be published, you know, never be published, or it will, it will take like thirty to fifty years to publish, like step by step, and to do peer verification and stuff like this. If 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 I if I treated this as a pure art. It will not be interesting to anyone because in art people are so overstimulated by whatever that they don't care about anything anymore. No, so uh, uh, so this is like interesting thing to try to be. And and I, I was like really flirting a lot with some kind of uh, methodologies of of investigative journalism because like we had a lot of friends who are into that, and I and I learned a lot of different methodologies and techniques. But in a way, like pure uh, investigative journalism I, we, we never managed to understand each other because for me i don't find the reason to to interview anyone except technical infrastructures you know like i my form of interviewing and communication with those spaces is basically data investigations and data collection and then i don't need so, so it's it's kind of it, it it doesn't belong to any field but 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 then on this road in trying to understand all of those like images and and and, and maps that that i was uh, creating i fell in love with a lot of different concepts and 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 wonderful uh, you know philosophers and 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 and, and, and ideas and basically the film that you will see is some kind of again map but it, it's kind of like mix not of infrastructures but mix of concepts and ideas that i really loved on this way of trying to understand those places that i really loved and i really cared about so i combined this in some kind of like uh um, Alec, uh, some kind of like a map or assemblage of different ideas and allegories it's maybe a bit hardcore for 10, 20, two, but, and, and I hope it will work well uh, technically. And uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's try to do that. And then we can speak about a bit later. Maybe one video the problem extra. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try to do that. And then we can speak. That's me. Maybe one video the problem. An assemblage of concepts and allegories. The word assemblage is usually understood as a collection or gathering of things or people, a machine or object made of pieces fitted together, or a work of art made by grouping together found or unrelated objects. The word assemblage this is map usually and accompanying footnotes are precisely that. 
One big messy assemblage of different concepts and ideas, assembled into one semi-coherent picture or let us say a map, a world view. One, gravity. Like Einstein's theory of relativity, massive objects curve the space and time of the topography of the internet, proportionally to their weight, defined by the number of their users and content. So we can think of massive monopolies and conglomerates such as Google and Facebook as enormous black holes that, with their gravity create a field so intense that it attracts and swallows the content and users. Two, forces, many other potential vectors and social forces contribute to that gravitational force. The fear of social isolation, economic and professional insecurity, unrealistic expectations of efficiency and productivity in the adapt or die environment, tailored addictions, depression and anxieties. These are just some of the other vectors that constitute social forces that keep us, with or without our wish, attached to those platforms. The social cost of opting out has become so high that opting out is essentially a fantasy. Three, black holes. Our imaginary hero is swimming against one of those platforms gravitational force. As they glide towards the singularity defined by the mass of these giants, users and Next moment, I kick technology. Uh, we have some kind of technical issues there, but um, I, I will try maybe to 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 explain this like first few chapters that you saw. So basically, okay, just a second. So basically, the the story is starting with uh, we will see. Uh, uh, person who is basically first idea that we are they are speaking there it's a it's idea of gravity and it, that idea is like really uh interesting for me to try to think about the internet as a as a as a space and that this space have different kinds of like gravity and 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 and, and basically that each of those objects to think like for example google facebook and all of that that all of them have a gravity and then to think about us how we are like flowing from one hole to another hole and how is basically for me like what is like really hard is how to avoid this uh, uh, gravity and now in the first chapter we have a person who is right who is swimming there and trying to swing faster and basically to avoid this situation of like falling into this uh, uh, hole falling into 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 this like a uh, 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 black hole that that is created by by some of those uh, technological uh, giants and then like interesting we can play now yeah okay new extractivism an assemblage of concepts and allegories the word assemblage is usually understood as a collection or gathering of things or people a machine or object made of pieces fitted together or a work of art made by grouping together found or unrelated objects. This map and accompanying footnotes are precisely that. One big messy assemblage of different concepts and ideas, assembled into one semi-coherent picture or let us say a map, a world view. 1. Gravity. Like Einstein's theory of relativity, massive objects curve the space and time of the topography of the Internet proportionally to their weight, defined by the number of their users and content. So we can think of massive monopolies and conglomerates such as Google and Facebook as enormous black holes that, with their gravity, create a field so intense that it attracts and swallows the content and users. 2. Forces Many other potential vectors and social forces contribute to that gravitational force. The fear of social isolation, economic and professional insecurity, unrealistic expectations of efficiency and productivity in the adapt or die environment, tailored addictions, depression and anxieties. These are just some of the other vectors that constitute social forces that keep us, with or without our wish, attached to those platforms. The social cost of opting out has become so high that opting out is essentially a fantasy. 3. Black holes. Our imaginary hero is swimming against one of those platforms' gravitational force. As they glide towards the singularity defined by the mass of these giants, users and content pass beyond the event horizon, 
the imaginary boundary in time and space, beyond which there is no return to the outer part of this universe. The event horizon defines the line after which the social and economic price of leaving those platforms is becoming too high. No matter how fast they try to swim now, the stream will pull them towards the center of the black hole. Without even noticing, this story's actor is now falling towards the hole into a new allegory, the cave. 4. Allegory of the Cave What takes place at the bottom of this metaphorical black hole can be described through Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Plato describes a group of people who spend their entire life chained to cave walls looking at a blank wall. These people are watching the shadows of real objects projected on this wall, giving them names and meanings. In our story, the script and directing of this performance of shadows are entrusted to human algorithmic machines that regulate, filter, censor and moderate the projected content on the walls of the cave. The existing elements and content that exist outside this cave and horizon of events create an information flow, a theater of shadows. 5. Walls The cave and tower walls are constructed of multiple opaque layers and built mostly by ghost work or invisible labor. The bricks of this structure are made of black boxes, closed code and hardware, glued together with the invisible network infrastructure. They are covered with layers of corporate secrets, patents and copyrights. 6. The Interface Interfaces are framing and structuring the projected algorithmic spectacle of images. Even though they are a direct manifestation of rules, regulations and taxonomies, they successfully obscure what is hidden beneath them. They define directly or indirectly what we can or cannot do. They are both tools and discursive frames. They are instituted as an order of discourse and embodiment of the discipline power of the platform. This cave is not only a prison cell, but it carries out the function of a factory hall and a resource extraction apparatus. The prisoner performs their threefold function as a worker, a resource and a product. 7. Shadows and Capture Agents the spectacle of a constant flow of information projected through the interface creates a digital shadow on the opposite wall of the cave. The projected digital shadow on the wall is a resource field where thousands of capture agents, tentacles of the rhizomatic surveillance complex, extract information. Every movement or emotional reaction is being recorded continuously. These capture agents can take many forms and sizes. From the tiny pieces of code, crawlers that wander the web, over the sensors catching heartbeats and surveillance cameras capturing our faces, to the complex network of satellites orbiting Earth. They can see our shadows through a full range of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can be invisible or massive like a 500 meters wide radio telescope. The process of quantification is reaching into the human affective, cognitive and physical worlds. Every segment of our existence reflected on our digital shadows, can be seen as a form of direct or indirect labor producing data as a behavioral surplus. When we breathe, walk, or sleep, every single emotion that we feel, our attention, our body temperature, or diseases that we have, everything can produce a behavioral surplus if being captured by surveillance apparatus. In that sense, even our bare existence within the walls of the cave can be seen as labor. Prisoner workers need to spend more and more hours maintaining their profiles in a similar fashion to sex workers in the windows of red light districts. Digital identity labor is the forced labor of the 21st century. This creates an auto-disciplinary society where each anomaly and misbehavior is detected and quantified. 8. Plotoptican the gravity of these techno giants hold billions of users, workers, products at the bottom of those caves. In this assemblage of allegories, millions of caves or prison cells form the unique and invisible panopticon structure. The central tower of this structure has two main functions, one, to project the content on the walls of the caves and, two, to surveil and capture the digital shadows of the prisoners reflected on the opposite wall. 9. Information Retrieval 
From each cell cave and through the core of the Panopticon Tower, streams of information are flowing into one of the central structures of this image, the data bank. The data bank is not just the engine room, but the power itself. From here, we are examining three processes crucial for this story. On one side, extracted, stored and analyzed personal data, is shaping the multidimensional portrait of the individual. On the second, all the products of the user's labor are being stored, analyzed and ranked, to form the information spectacle of images, meanings, and reputations. Furthermore, in the third one, this structure lies upon the top of the exploitation of human minds, bodies and nature. 10. Creation of data body. Our online behavior is captured, processed, and deconstructed into statistical vectors, clusters, patterns and anomalies. Each move we make is carefully analyzed by thousands of mathematical functions, algorithms and machine learning systems. This system, does not see us through linear narratives emerging from our browsing behavior, metadata, or movements in physical space but as n-dimensional statistical projections. Each and every one of our clicks sharpens the resolution and complexity of this abstract and constantly changing statistical portrait or data body. 11. Dividuals. These multidimensional data portraits of the individual, consisting of millions of data points in hundreds of dimensions, can be seen as what Deleuze will name individual. A physically embodied human subject that is endlessly divisible and reducible to data representations via the modern technologies of control. The critical art ensemble is describing this data body as the fascist sibling of the virtual body, a much more highly developed virtual form, and one that exists in complete service to the corporate and police state. 12. Condividuals? Dividual is always open to interaction, always ready to be detached from, and attached to, other individuals that share some properties with it, creating collective agents as condividuals, or supersubjects. The mountains and valleys of multidimensional ever-changing invisible algorithmic landscapes are clustering individual dividuals and creating new relations, taxonomies, and ontologies. 13. Surveillance Assemblage The full picture of our individual being is not centralized in one place but is spread across hundreds of data centers in the rhizomatic assemblage of the surveillance economy and government actors. This non-heterogeneous and dispersed assemblage portrait exists through the system of data dealers, the official and unofficial exchange of data, in constant flow forming one functional entity. 14. Content Extraction each web page or other piece of content that is being captured in the wild is rendered and analyzed. This content is being extracted into hundreds of different signals. Collected content and extracted data become a permanent corporate resource for creating multidimensional, dynamic, complex topologies in which every piece of data becomes an object that is contextually linked to other objects. Within this map, this new meta-territory, crawl hundreds of different mathematical functions, algorithms, and neural networks that we can call instruments of measurement and perception. 15. Instruments of measurement and perception. Those instruments of measurement and perception always come with inbuilt aberrations. The shape of the algorithmic lenses is carefully crafted to project the image that is in accordance with the platform's financial interest and political goals and values. Platforms often imply direct rules and regulations. They have direct power of regulation of what can be seen or said, what kind of content can and cannot exist in their universe. Here we are visually representing those rules and regulations as filters. Similarly to the algorithmic lenses, the fabric of those filters is crafted according to the platform's financial interests and political goals and values. 16. Projection of the world. Instruments of measurement and perception are ranking and defining hierarchies and relations between content, users and meaning. They define the digital regime of truth and order. This regime is a prism through which the world is projected in the form of the constant stream of spectacles on the walls of the caves. 17. 
engines of extraction. Empowered by the digital extractivism tools of the information age, everything becomes a potential frontier for expansion and extraction. From the depth of DNA code in every single cell of the human organism, to vast frontiers of human emotions, behavior and social relations, to nature as a whole, everything becomes the territory for the new extractivism. At this moment in the 21st century, we see a new form of extractivism that is well underway, one that reaches into the furthest corners of the biosphere and the deepest layers of human cognitive and effective being. 18. Enclosure and Affinity to Infinity In the transition to the information age, capitalism was given a chance to satisfy its affinity for infinity, to form and conquer an infinite number of new territories, to create new mechanisms for the accumulation of capital within these new spaces and to formulate new forms of exploitation. Once the territory is invaded, the process of enclosure and exploitation is established. New forms of extractivism are expanding into the territories far behind the biodiversity and knowledge enclosure. This is why we are not speaking anymore just about the knowledge economy but about the attention economy, emotion economy, and many other new economies being born from the invasion of new territories of extraction. 19. Fractal Supply Chains Supply chains hidden behind the engines of extractivism are black boxes as much as neural networks or algorithms hidden behind interfaces. Each triangle of this fractal represents one phase in the production process, from birth in a geological process, through life as a consumer product, and ultimately to death in an electronics dump. Within the fractal supply chain, we see a perpetual dance between human labor, non-human labor, earth labor and atomatization. 20. Blood, sweat, and toxic lakes. Every click or swipe we make online creates one little hole in the ground, filled with toxic waste and covered by toxic clouds. Every movement of materials and data within the planetary scale factory has its own hidden price. Supply chains are optimized towards maximizing profit for a few, while the real costs of the destruction that follows are shared among all the living entities on the planet in the present and the future. One molecule after another is extracted by labor and technique to make things for humans, but the waste products don't return so that the cycle can renew itself. 21. Triangular Trade Slavery was at the heart of the development of the modern planetary-scale global economy. From those days, the same model of constant flow within the vast fractal production chains expanded in time, space and complexity. The transatlantic slave trade evolved into the contemporary planetary scale factory. 22. Chains of Digital Colonialism Traditional colonial practices of control over critical assets, trade routes, natural resources and exploitation of human labor are still deeply embedded in the contemporary supply chains, logistics and assembly lines of digital content, products and infrastructure. In that sense, chains of digital colonialism are made both on the extraction of digital surplus and the traditional exploitation of labor and resources. The concepts presented are mostly represented here visually, in the form of allegories. Dictionaries define allegory as a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. All of these allegories and concepts together, joined in the form of an assemblage, create together a blueprint of a machine-like superstructure, or a super-allegory. In that sense, what we have here is an almost fractal allegorical structure, an allegory, within an allegory, within an allegory. <laughs> you survived, no? <laughs> no, don't worry, it's not about you. No one should see this <laughs> like in, in one piece and, 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 and be exposed to this in the morning. So just relax, everything it's okay. Uh, no, I don't know. There, there is so many different aspects of, of, of I think it's really condensed and, and probably if if I need to do it again, I will probably make it 
maybe not shorter maybe maybe you know i will i will make some some parts different but but the idea about this it started basically i, I don't know which research I, I was doing and then i was like um, i had a lot of fun you, you remember there was, there was one scene in which you have a person that is like marionette yeah. and then that, that that's basically the first one and i fell in love with with, with that one because like it, it for me it represents and it, I, I also think this this image it's on the cover of the book of uh, kate crawford or no never mind mm -hmm. uh, and and so for me this is this was like really great you know like you have like a human being and then you have like uh, this this prism it's basically some kind of metaphor for prism also it, it was the name of this nsa program but it's a it's a it's a metaphor of uh surveillance because like what they do in metadata surveillance it's basically the same thing that is happening within prison prism you have like a light and then you are basically breaking this light into different kinds of information and then reading this information so this is like some kind of um let's say metadata in, uh, investigation metaphor no? and then you have a, a, a data set and now all of this information is basically connected with this marionette sticks how do you call that and this is controlling the the same human being so the the data that we produce are basically controlling us because like if we think uh like most of the 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 you know in different kind of systems and and those systems are really important in our life they see us not as a as a human beings you know like they see us as some kind of data structures so you are yumebug this you are your bank account you are the the number of the passport you know when you are traveling somewhere you are those numbers you're nothing else you know and the systems doesn't see you as a human being and they do not uh, uh, care about anything else by by except like putting you in some some kind of like a database and system of of of, of control so so that that's super interesting for me so it started with this like uh, illustration and then i really had the fun of like thinking of okay how different philosophical concepts or, or ideas or abstract concepts can be represented in a form of patent drawings because like all of those images here they really look like uh, some kind of patent drawings because i was like really into invest when when we were doing a uh, uh, investigation of those facebook algorithms one one of the main for, uh, methodologies of investigation were, were to investigate patents and then we were reading like hundreds and hundreds of pu publicly available patents and most of them have like really funny drawings like this kind of like how this kind of like microsoft uh, engineer together with some kind of illustrator how they are like you know explaining the world and that was like super interesting for me and then I always I was thinking okay what if I combine this kind of style of of pattern drawings and and try to 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 illustrate philosophical concepts as a patterns and then the next crazy thing that led to this it was idea how it will look this kind of you remember the painting of uh, of uh, Hieronymus Bosch this delight of earth and what is the name you know? so how it will look the painting that have this kind of like uh you know three parts and that 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 have like so many different you know things happening different concepts and ideas and this is how basically i came to to this uh map and then this map became um this video and yeah i, I think we, i think maybe even this was too much if, if we have a time for uh yeah. for maybe questions or or feel free to to uh, i'll definitely <clears throat> give you a chance to to interact with Vladan, and uh, if you have questions this is the time or, or idea or yeah comments or... comments so uh, 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 as a moderator yeah I'll we'll do my job uh, <laughs> And I give a couple of comments uh, because we started with information media literacy, which is not anymore even a buzzword. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a state of the mind. 
uh, that we have to in, in engage, that we have to develop uh, a, a new kind of literacies. But uh, whenever I speak about it, I just can't help myself uh, in terms that we are in need, I would say, critical information media literacy and uh, uh, to have in mind the environment that you are, were explaining, because if we are going just to stick on this uh, 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 digital skills and uh, 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 with, without this whole picture, then we are actually in a kind of, a, 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 I don't know, scientific kindergarten, I would say, in terms of information media literacy. So uh, 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 thank you very much for, 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 for having you here, for the opportunity to somehow even, uh, 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 you also help me in this way, to, uh, uh, because the most of the time I have a problems also to translate to the broader audience why it's so important and why, uh, uh, the programs and curricula with information media literacy <clears throat> are uh, lacking this uh, uh, political approach because the apolitical uh, uh, standard in teaching information media literacy definitely just uh, confirms the the hegemony uh, 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 of the of the digital power. So uh, I don't know, maybe somebody. Yeah, I can just add to that that this is completely like the the question of like. Are we creating media literacy to create new workers? So this is like, mm. and and what kind of like workers we are going to create? Are we going to create someone who is able to think critically about the the uh, for the beginning to understand at all that where where this person is working, you know, like to understand the factory because this is what we don't understand. We don't understand that this kind of new relation between us and those platforms in in the sense of like labor re relation we don't as a youtuber or or a person who is watching youtube or whatever with youtube it's really not clear this kind of labor re relation and why how this is really functioning so if we are going to just to teach people how to 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 be some kind of blind workers in this new environment then yes then it's only about skills how to use different platforms how to use different tools but if we want to 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 make them think about like their position within those systems then it's probably then what we need it's it's this kind of like a critical uh, and political angle on all of those relations and this is like really lacking in 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 most of the curriculums that exist on on, on, on digital media literacy yeah yeah uh, i also would like uh, to comment on this i think it's a really interesting perspective and there is never enough perspectives on these new models to to get some more understanding so uh, if we look at this this might also be the difference between digital literacy I know how to use uh, yeah. YouTube and this stuff and real information literacy. I understand at least to some part the political dimension and the complexity and the, the social construct or whatever. No? And uh, I think for this, any of this visualization and stuff is really, really important. Uh, what I'm asking myself is how do we really approach this in teaching and at which level? If we look at the real complexity of this, let's call it the YouTube factory, for example, no? how can we? Uh, uh, integrate this very very complex world and uh, create some understanding at different levels of uh, education yeah this is certainly not the, the most accessible uh, format because it's really, like really dense but I, I still believe that that we but the thing is like we are in in not even in the phase of uh phase of understanding completely you know in order to teach in order to to create some kind of curriculum for for schools you know from primary schools how we can create cur curriculum if we by ourselves are not able to to access to understand and the 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 in in that sense i think we the one of the main main issues there it's this kind of like transparency of those systems and and, and but also not just transparency on one side transparency but on the other side, like we need to have uh, social sciences and, and philosophy and art helping us in, in trying to visualize and explain those, those 
places because they, in other way we will not be able to 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 include this into into education or, or mm. yeah. we need to to find the way we need to find the language we need to find the visual language we need to find the way how to to explain those relations and i still think mm -hmm. we are lacking that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. i think we have questions yeah. now uh first question yeah Valentina. Vale. Vale, vale. Hi. Ciao. Uh, great. I did see the first, I did say it's an evolution. My question is around hope. Because <laughs> if you look at this, you get paralyzed. So in terms of uh, education, if this is a place where the people should educate themselves and then others, how we embed agency and hope? Because there are in the crack hacks. No, people leave, people try but the system is overwhelming. So I'm curious how we bring and build hope because paralysis will not help anything, no? And by the way, in the cavern, as you say, women's and gender diverse people were not in. So I think that there are people that are outside the cave somehow because they are not recognized even if described. But I'm curious about how we bring hope into education and pedagogy. I'm an activist. <laughs> no, but, hmm. but you, you don't think we have uh, you don't think we have enough hope and positivity around technology I think so I practice discipline of hope but I think that Produce a framework that we do not mention. No, but because I, what, what I, you know, what I think, what I feel, it's like technology now. It's on the, it's in, it's on steroids. It's on some kind of like the top of the the mountains of gods. You know, it, it doesn't need hope. It needs few slaps. Uh, in in that sense, like there is the the hope. The promise, the 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 beauty, the functionality, the usability, the all of that, it's it, it it's there. It's 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 all over us. Like we live it, we accept it, it's ours. It's like, but what we, you know, like maybe maybe we within some circles we are tired of, of like critical thinking about and criticism, yes, like because like it's probably for certain amount of people, but in general. The, the the sentiment is yes this is great give me more this is helping me to do so many things and this is the way i want to do in in, in future i don't think that that, that uh, and in the in that sense i found for example like this is really the the question that is like always asked most of the time asked on on, on events it's like okay but what now and how what we can do and and then like I, yeah i just don't I, I don't think it's my my uh my role why we should yeah yeah why we should like all have like for me it's it's enough like uh i'm okay with uh with um yeah giving this kind of like dark and and even this video it's white but uh, but then, then the, when we were like speaking about like we can go back to this metaphor of of like black hole or like gravity, and and what I really uh, like, and I don't know who told me, like I think Felix Stadler, he he said like, but there is like really beautiful uh, metaphor that you can add there, and this is this it, it's called escape velocity. So when you are, are on Earth and you have like first when you want to go out with the rocket, like you need to break those kind of escape velocity, you know? and that means a lot of lot of lot of energy to 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 spend in order to run away from this gravity. But then you are almost free up. No, but then the main question for me is again this: like who can uh, uh, afford? that amount of energy to escape this gravity 
but in the same thing like who can now fly with the ro rocket you know again it's a uh, bezos and <laughs> so the thing is like the capacity to to run away capacity to beat this it comes with the privilege of like usually like privilege of of being able to either have a lot of money or stable job or or stable relation or whatever you have so you don't need to be part of that you know so you can run away and you don't need to use mobile phone you know or you don't need to have a picture on you know like profile on social media so so th this is like this kind of in the beginning of video this kind of it, it's about this forces and about this gravity and 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 like who can basically have this chance to be outside of of, of this if, if we want to be outside of this so for for me this is like always always a interesting question i would like to uh, uh take another question it's my colleague uh, professor damir arsenievich from university of tuzla so hi thank you very much for this amazing presentation i was very much taken by the um by the visual actually and there, there's something scopophilic hmm. uh, around this and then this possibly ties to the um to development of our capacities and vocabularies to talk about this are there any other ways rather than privileging the visual mm. through which we can render translate modulate what we have seen because i think i think or have they been investigated because i yeah. think this would add to to our, us bypassing the opacity mm. and mm. the complexity yeah yeah no the 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 reason why i'm I speak in a visual way because I know how to do that and I feel like more comfortable in, in that way. And I can say that any of those media like text, visual, map, video, they all have their own rules, you know, and especially if we speak about cartography, this is like, it's a, it's a really tricky, as I said, like tricky, tricky territory to be in because like what you are doing, basically you are, even you are, you are, you are in some way presenting something as a map it's a form of illusion you know it's always it's always like a lie it's always like it's 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 always representation of reality someone's representation of reality it's never directly reality so it's always in between uh, art and science or whatever uh so in that sense and then within the map you have a you need to develop some kind of language and basically, this language is, is, a, is a basically some form of classification of reality. And then if we know every form of classification in a way, it's, it's a wrong, you know, it's, it's always biased. It's always my classification. So all of those maps, even they pretend to be like, you know, serious and whatever. At the end, if you really want to speak open about them, it's form of storytelling. You know, it's form of some kind of narratives. It's, it's, it's a, it's a non non-linear story this is the map and and uh, and i really like that i really like that and i feel really uh comfortable in in that form of like uh non uh, you know like in in that that space that that maps give me much more than in in the in the in the literary form or in the video form because like those kind of like linear narratives for me are kind of like oh, okay i rather give people like territory and then they can within this territory they can make their own stories or try to read that on their own way, way. but but I, what i realize is that like it it is really hardly to to have them separate you know in a way so it's really because it, when you create the map you need to have an essay next to it in order to ground this narrative in order to give some kind of key how to read the the the, the map how to read so it, it's always some kind of it's a multimedia you know and 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 i, I think we, we should try to find the different ways how you know every media is good you know like i, I you know I would love to do like a radio drama or like you know like theater play about this and and but but 
I don't know, I somehow stick to the maps and I feel uh, safe and good there and, 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 and it's, yeah. Okay, so we run out of time. Thank you very much, Vladan, for uh, uh, your wonderful and uh, uh, awakening presentation. Uh, And if we speak about hope, I think that we should try again to find and reach for a hope in art and humanities. I always uh, 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 mention the book of uh, Neil Postman, The End of Education, in which he says that uh, technology ed education should be treated as a branch of humanities. So uh, uh, th that's where I would uh, uh, try to find some some hope for, for, for this situation we are uh, uh, sharing together in this uh, 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 digital nihilism, actually, that you uh, uh, explained. So uh, we continue with the program, and I'll let Thomas uh, uh, do it. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mario. And I think there will be a lot of talks over the coffee break on these uh, power structures that were uh, introduced now. And maybe one of the or potentials or counter weapons, let's say, is really open knowledge and open science and uh, trying to work against these uh, 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 platforms that are very profit oriented. And with that, we come to the topic of the next talk and next presentation. And I invite uh, Stefan Dreisiedner and Leah Webekind to the front. Uh, they will talk about uh, issues related to open educational resources. How can we bring open knowledge to uh, citizens? And um, what is the current state of the art in this uh, dimension? We we'll see that yeah, it's actually oh, uh, not too many uh, universities, for example, use open educational resources. Um, the talk is uh, comes out of a project that we are conducting together with some partners. And the talk will be given by Stefan Dreisiedner, who did a PhD at the University of Graz in Austria and uh, is currently at the University of Hildesheim and uh, researching and teaching in our uh, department. And he will unfortunately very soon leave us again and will uh, be, uh, will, uh, start a professorship in Austria. And uh, uh, the second presenter, they will share this presentation, is Leah Webekind, who is a PhD student at the University of Hildesheim and who is doing research in how do we measure user experience for children, what kind of uh, you know, questionnaires and so on can we develop that are reliable for this uh, complex task. So please, Stefan and Leah, we will looking forward. Okay, thank you very much for this um, kind introduction. Um, yeah, um, we are very happy to be here today and to continue this very interesting presentation with um, yeah, one possible solution, also how to spread um, knowledge um, despite all the economic um, um, yeah, things that develop out of, out of digitalization um, in a free and open way. Um, so um, we will focus on critical success factors on such open educational resources um, from two sides. So first from a student's perspectives, and then also we will talk about um, a teacher's or professional expert perspective. So um, at first I would like to start shortly with a definition on, on open educational resources. So um, we could say, um, or we would draw here now to the UNESCO definition, which was um, defined in 2019. And we could say that OER is more or less about teaching, learning, research materials in any form or medium um, that um, are in a public domain and where the copyright has been released. Um, and there is no cost, of course, um, that can be freely reused, freely proposed. Um, adaptation and redistribution is also um, easily um, possible. And the main factor here is this open license um, where we can easily um, yeah, reuse, repropose it. So this is the mo most important thing here, actually. So um, let's see how I can, oh, yeah. okay. 
have to adopt to the technical environment. Perfect. Um, yeah, and but it's um, not that easy. So there is even more about OER. So there's several types of OER. So um, we could overall say there are a lot of small kinds of OER. So we could call them small OER. Um, actually, our set of slides as we have today, we could give it an open license and publish it. This would be then also one way of to have OER. I could just publish the text here on my, on my lecture slide. This would be another way. Um, but you could also take other materials that can be also used offline. Let's say um, create an infographic and, and share this. This can be also printed out um, and shared. So also this could be an OER. And also all other kinds, it could be also um, teaching plans, um, curricula, um, but also multimedia content, software, computer applications. And then we have a bigger form of OER. So this could be open courseware or a massive open online courses um, where I have really full grown courses. And this could consist of a lot of smaller elements. So there could be then interactive quizzes, also small videos, also lecture slides, but all together to a full interactive course. And I could also have open textbooks, which might also consist of several small um, yeah, contents that are then again organized to a textbook. So we see OER could have a lot of different forms and therefore a lot of different use cases. And the background where we are working on OER, as Thomas Mandel already shortly mentioned before, is the Decrease project. So a project um, that is um, yeah, financed by Erasmus Plus. Um, and we have several partners here involved. Um, University of Hildesheim is one of them. And the content we are talking today now, um, especially about these critical success factors, is one of several work packages we have in this project. Um, starting point was there the situation in the COVID-19 crisis in digital teaching and learning and how institutions deal with that. This was also the starting point of the project. Then also later on looking at quality perceptions, digital education use at all um, general at the involved institutions and later on to develop critical success factors. And building on that, we are now um, working and then further things will also happen like optimization of existing OER and also an apprenticeship framework for crisis situations. This will also come later and all these work packages are also um, done by different partners in collaboration. So um, also very um, interactive um, and international um, collaboration. And what we are now building on is, is a evaluation framework that was uh, yeah, defined actually by um, or done by all partners they work on it, led by colleagues uh, from Bulgaria. Uh, from University of Library Studies in Sofia. And there our aim was to identify um, critical success factors for, or for OER evaluation based on a literature review. Um, and yeah, we, this was quite um, an extensive work and led to an extensive list. A big question here is always, how can we identify and how what it makes actually quality OER and how can we evaluate such OER? So this is the big background question here. Um, where we could relate to would be the quality cycle um, in relation to OER. So we could always say we have somehow a starting point where we develop our resources, um, then we upload them, moderate them, and one important thing is then also to have some channel, some robust metadata, as well as I want to allow easy retrieval of these resources um, so that it's really fitting to the purpose I'm intending. Um, not just as teacher, probably also as student. Um, so I want to find resources that are intended for self-learning also, for example. But as teacher, probably I also want to know, um, is it a resource that is fitting to my course concept? Is it uh, yeah for undergraduate, graduate level, and so on? And then when we have our OER finally um, in the open world, then it is also evaluated by the environment. So um, teachers search and find resources. Um, they use the teaching resource and assess the impact of it. Um, and they might also give feedback and rate resources, depending then if you have such mechanisms in place. Um, at least it will always happen in some way as teachers will reuse it when they're happy about it, definitely. They might recommend it to others. So even when there is no formal mechanism, it's always happened somehow in the background. Um, but um, there could be also some formal mechanisms. And actually on such formal mechanisms, this was also the um, idea of our um, quality factors we are working on. 
Yeah, and this um, literature review letter and do evaluation framework um, consisting of four main building blocks. So looking at the learning content, um, the learning management system and technological tools, the learning process and pedagogy around um, OER, and then value added services. And all of this should lead to OER that is ready to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and of course, to redistribute. So um, this is just um, to give you a short overview. This led to also to a kind of um, form that can be used where you can say give in several general information. And for all of this um, quality criteria, there are several sub criteria that can be also weighted on a scheme from one to five and can be also commented. And this would be one way to evaluate um, this OER. And we will now also later on look in more detail on this quality factor um, from a student perspective. So overall, what we want to achieve here now with um, this um, look from the students and teacher perspective. We want to look actually um, to get some kind of a case study how these critical success factors work in practice and to map them also to um, working practice at the, especially the project partners, um, institutions. And in the end, this should lead to a better understanding of the relation of these success factors that were previously defined on the implementation and use in of digital learning, specifically in OER, and should lead finally also to a yeah, understanding of critical success factors um, in times of COVID crisis, but also beyond. And yeah, so this. We will now focus actually, we did also more work on this. We did a student survey, document analysis, a Metalfi study with experts, then also um, a proposal on, on how these um, success factors can be also um, um, made more specific. And um, we will focus now on two things, so especially, especially the student survey and the Delphi study on the experts. And yeah, Leah will now continue as the results of our student survey. Mm -hmm. So a few words on the development on the questionnaire. So we asked um, several questions about um, yeah, to get a better understanding also on use on students' experience with OER, with digital learning materials. So we asked about the innovations of OER, also students' opinion on yeah, reasons to use OER, also about the challenges and uh, yeah, potential in uh, for study programs. The second part is more about the uh, rating of the success factors. So you can see here uh, the four factors and we asked students to rank them um, based on their importance to them. So all in all, it was a quite long survey, but we also did a pre-test on, on the DECRIS European Summer School in, in August 2022. And the main study was uh, conducted yeah, as an online survey in September and October 2022. So about some um, demographic data. So we have students from four countries, Croatia, Bulgaria, Germany, and Spain, who participated in our study. So most of them are, are bachelor students between 18 and 25. And they come from different um, field of studies, for example, library and information science, also information technology, as well as uh, sociology and languages. So we will look now into the results. So based on the questions, we, we wanted to know if students ever used existing OERs for their, for their studies. And it's yeah, nice to see that they um, have experience with OER. We also wanted to know from where they used OER. So here we can see uh, yeah, different um, sources. So on the one hand, professors provided um, OER in their, um, in their study program, but we can also see that um, students uh, searched for um, OERs on their own. So they used, for example, Google or also um, yeah, repositories to find OER. We also wanted to know what kind of OERs um, they were using. As we just heard, there are different formats, uh, of course, available. So um, we can see here that most, uh, the most prominent um, 
formats where presentation slides, for example, or um, visual media. So of course, online videos or also uh, screencasts, but also yeah, more interactive OERs like uh, quizzes or um, general courses. We also wanted to know how um, the digital resources were yeah, implemented in teaching. And yeah, this is really interesting. We see on the one hand that um, professors uh, provided OERs, but we can also see that students searched for OER on their own. We can later see some reasons uh, for that. So this is also really, really interesting. We ask for user-centered elements that might be important for students when they when they are using OERs. So here we can see yeah, different uh, elements that are important for them. Um, for example, um, supporting creativity and innovation is quite important for students, but also um, the um, yeah, invention to support uh, design thinking. Storytelling, for example, as well as gamification uh, are supposed to be less important uh, for students. So, so this is quite interesting. We also ask on um, students if they think an OER should consider different um, learning, a student's learning style. So this is what you can see on the right side. And we see that the learning type of activists is quite um, um, available. So um, activists, they, they want to involved in learning experience in problem solving or yeah, different opportunities. So it's supposed that this type of uh, learning style, um, yeah, they are supposed to learn less when they're just listening to, to lectures or um, yeah, to long explanations. So to conclude this part of the study, we can see uh, what's really nice that uh, students have um, quite some experience with OER. We can identify different uh, usage scenarios. So on the one hand, OERs are used um, in classes, so they are provided by teachers. But we can also see that uh, bachelor students um, individually search and use OER, for example, as, as an additional learning um, material for their classes they're visiting. About user-centered elements, so they seem to be quite important um, to mention two of them. Like I already mentioned, um, OERs should support um, the creativity as well as um, the potential for innovation, as well as some kind of yeah, personal personalization that is uh, important for students. So this is the first part of um, the study. We uh, collected additional um, feedback uh, with some open questions. And yeah, we did some uh, content analysis and identified important categories that, they, that you can see here. And we could also rank them. So when we look at reasons to use OER, uh, the most prominent um, reason to use OER is uh, the open access. So students uh, highly value the possibility to access um, learning materials uh, for free. But um, as already mentioned, also as some kind of additional learning material uh, for classes, this is quite important. We can also see that um, students are yeah, really value the, the quality of the contents they are um, learning with. So we can also see that they have quite some trust in the resources they are using. And as I already said, that creativity and innovation is important. Um, this is um, based on the last uh, category, interactivity. So this is also something that um, students uh, like when they are using OERs. When we look at uh, barriers to use OER, when, you, when we look at the first, the second, and the fourth uh, category, we can see that there might be some technological issues. So students um, criticize that um, they, are, they are missing some kind of repository or platform to access um, OERs. Um, also, sometimes they mention that 
there are some issues with the availability so um, sites might um, require some kind of registration or also payment so this is uh, supposed to be a barrier when um, finding and uh, using OERs but we can also see um, yeah, a few students mentioned uh, that they don't see any barriers to use OER which is also quite good to see and interestingly the, the uh, last category outdated materials this is quite interesting so um, also in context with the um, quality that is important for students, we can see that a barrier might be that they think that um, materials they are finding might be uh, outdated or yeah, not up to date. So we also asked for um, guidance that students have for, um, for teachers, for the faculty. So this is quite um, interesting. So the results show that um, students have quite an idea um, of the concept of OERs, but um, so they are used to digital um, education because of the crisis, of course, but they um, want more promotion of OER among classes. Um, so uh, they think that more information on the use of OER as a um, learning material, material should be uh, spread among students. Um, the second guidance would be to provide better accessibility and also a good user experience. So um, they yeah, see uh, some kind of accessibility problems and also um, mentioned that, for example, OERs should be available on all different types of devices. So also maybe from, from um, smaller devices like um, smartphones. Last but not least, um, teachers should publish more OER. So this is also quite interesting that they uh, ask teachers to, to publish um, their materials as um, open access. We also ask about um, the students' opinions on um, the future of OER for teaching and learning. And here we can see quite some um, different opinions on that. So um, on the one hand, uh, students indicate that more research in OER uh, in higher education is needed, but they also see some kind of improvement of um, technology and teaching. Um, they think that OERs can promote some kind of um, networking as well as knowledge sharing, which is quite nice. But they also see that there might be some special um, use cases for OER in higher education. So they think that um, OERs might not be suitable for all use cases, which is also quite interesting. Last but not least, um, OER can prevent inequalities. This is also an interesting point when we think of um, digital divide, for example. So students indicate that um, the use of OER in, in higher education can maybe not remove uh, inequalities between students, but maybe reduce um, any kind of um, issues here. So now we come to the uh, ranking of the success factors. So this was the second part of our study. And you can see here the um, results of the ranking of the uh, four main success factors. So this included learning content and learning experience design, learning process, um, learning management system, and value added services. So here we can see um, that the most prominent um, or most important category, category includes um, learning content and um, learning experience design. And this, I think it fits quite uh, well in the um, results we already got. So um, that students highly value um, the content quality of OER. So they really trust in the content they are using and also the um, yeah, the open access, which is quite important. And we can see also here that uh, value added services, so they are supposed to be less important for students. So this also includes um, 
the um, metadata, for example, or a comprehensive um, description of OER. So maybe this is something that might be more important um, yeah, for teachers um, than for, for students. So we can also see here that the results um, between the factors, they are quite um, yeah, very small. So we also did some ranking of the sub factors per, per category. As you can see here for um, the first category of learning content and um, learning experience design. So um, the most prominent one here is uh, the content quality, availability, the convenience, alignment and accuracy. So the, the learning material that they are using should be, of course, um, yeah, also be suitable for, for the classes they are um, visiting. The second category includes um, um, two sub factors for the learning management system. And here we can see that the quality of the final product or service is uh, really important. So this includes, for example, um, also the sound or audio quality of, um, of the OER, if it's a video, for example but also um, or the production value, as well as um, yeah, the second factor um, that is also important, um, the, maybe the integration into, into Moodle in any kind of uh, LMS, as well as technological mm -hmm. issues. The next one is about um, the learning process and pedagogy. So here we can see um, this also fits quite well with the other results that um, the open license, the open access is important, as well as the access accessibility for students. And last but not least, um, the factor of value added services. This is also quite interesting that we see that um, the monitoring and um, possibility to evaluate uh, an OER is really important for students. So here we yeah, might also consider some kind of OER evaluation framework, especially for students, maybe not only for teachers. So as they, yeah, as they uh, think the quality of the content is quite important um, and also yeah, that they value some kind of peer review process of, um, of the sources they are using. So to conclude this part of the study, so we can see quite some um, reasons and uh, motivations of students to, to use OER. The most prominent one, ones include uh, the open access possibility, uh, as I already said, um, the uh, quality of an OER, as well as the availability on different uh, platforms, for example. But we can also see that the ranking results are, they are not very clear. So it seems like all factors are yeah, very um, prominent and important for students. But we can also see here that um, students um, highly value uh, the use of OER in teaching. So this is something that should be um, yeah, included in, in future teaching. Okay, so thank you very much, Lea, for this nice overview of the student's perspective. So what I personally also think is really nice that we see here the students really already know about OER, use it, um, but they also, to us teachers, give us quite an important task so that we really should produce more, more OER, so they want more. So actually, I think this is also a, a very good final conclusion here from the student side. Um, yeah, and so um, I would know now shortly want to go also to the teacher's perspective, um, which we did as part of our Delphi study, um, or small, they could also say small Delphi study, um, where we wanted to um, yeah look deeper on these um, factors from um, the, the experts' um, opinion. We also looked there also at the students' perspectives, um, discussed the whole evaluation framework, um, yeah, to come up with also some idea how experts perceive it. Um, and this consists actually of three phases. Um, we had here um, four international experts from different countries involved. Um, the um, starting point was we provided them with our um, yeah, um, quality factors so that they get into this um, 
into these factors um, that um, we have also had a short survey. And then the main part was a discussion. So we discussed um, on the factors and the different goals and also um, how we kind of can proceed with them. And the follow up is then also a, a short survey again, um, also on <clears throat> some small changes, how to make them a little bit more clearly um, for external experts. So, um, what were our main findings here from the expert point of view? The first thing was that we saw that even among experts, there was some disagreement. What is OER? So they really want to have a kind of OER definition first. So to um, somehow also know when can I use this evaluation form, when it can be, will be applicable. Um, and what do we mean with OER? Do we focus on a specific form of OER or is it open for all forms? So also like if we have just a, a infographic um, that is printed out, so also for non-digital domains. This was um, the first First thing. Um, then the next thing was um, we, if we provide them with an evaluation form, which is pretty short and pretty, pretty, pretty precise, this um, can be very helpful. But if you have never seen it before, it can be also sometimes quite hard to understand what all factors means, especially it depends how deep you are into OER. So therefore, um, a little bit extended version, including short explanations, could be beneficial also to make such evaluation instruments better understand even for OER experts. So um, here also the documentation side is something that seems to be very important. And then the next thing is about ranking or rating specifically. So um, you have seen sure before at this um, short view of this evaluation form, we also included some rating mechanism. And there's actually not really agreement among experts if rating of OER in a formal way is really good. So some say it might even put off other teachers to, to put on the material as um, OER should be also, um, yeah, not too much work probably you can should also um pub publish things and then when you have the fear that you might get rating one of five and then everyone that searches for your name online will find oh you published some oer um, and this is badly rating so probably this is not a good teacher so this might really put you off and but on the other hand you did a very great thing you, you shared your teaching material made it available to others so you did a very positive thing and in the end you received worse ratings and um, other people find a bad rating of you online and people that don't publish it don't have bad ratings online. So this can lead to really strange situations. So therefore the question was in which way such a formal rating should be really as, as, at least online so that it is publicly available. So this is also one thing that needs to be considered regarding um, rating. Yeah, and then we come to the difficult thing that we have so many different kinds of OER. So how do we come up with a common um, scheme for rating them or can be there even a common scheme, especially if you include some rating. So um, we discussed, for example, about the problem of having very interactive big OER, which is probably developed in a very complex process with international collaboration, um, with a lot of interactive elements. Um, and such um, OER might receive very good ratings in, in, in such a scheme. And then we might have a very great infographic intended to be printed out in regions where there is not limited internet access, um, it would be a great OER for its um, intended purpose, probably, but it would receive a less rating or a worse rating on such a scheme if it is very general. So this is another issue. So probably if we want to have, uh, we want probably have even need specific um, rating schemes then. Um, then, as Leah already mentioned before, would be the possibility or the difference between creators' view and um, and also the view from users, specifically stu students, but also other teachers. So also here we might have some differences. Um, for example, students um, don't um, care about all elements or don't need all elements that um, users that use them for teaching um, would need. And or if we as content publisher, what we should probably focus on. Not all of this would be relevant for, for students. Um, so um, the press of metadata, by example, we should consider. And uh, so this is another issue. Um, and the final thing is also um, that also it depends where we publish OER. So through which providers, which repositories we use. And also they um, 
at least influence a little bit how we share our, our OER and what we can actually provide. So not of them have the opportunity to share that much of metadata or the metadata might be given by the repository I'm using. So um, also therefore this, oh, and also the licenses I can use to publish this. This might be also then given by um, where I publish it. So. Um, then additionally, I would also need probably additional instruments for providers and repositories um, and yeah, the um, OER itself. So, so there, there could be a difference. Um, yeah, so um, overall, so we see there are some things we also have to consider also from the experts view. And this would be also finally our um, conclusion on this. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, for um, yeah, We're looking now if there's some time for any questions. And also we will be here the remaining um, day and also tomorrow. So we are also happy to answer any questions and have any discussions on this topic with you in the breaks and also out, outside on the conference. Thank you. So I think uh, given the time, I, we should probably move on to the next talk already. So please, uh, unfortunately, we have to push the questions into the break. Uh, but there will be a long break, so we can uh, have discussions there. And with that, we move on to the next talk. And I think uh, Mario will introduce the speaker. So we are concluding the first part of the today's program. Uh, now uh, I'm going to introduce you to Sanel Huskic, senior researcher of the Institute for Social Researches at the Faculty of Political Sciences. Uh, uh, Sanel Huskic is Sarajevo-based research analyst with more than 20 years of professional experience. He was involved with numerous international and intergovernmental organizations in this capacity, as well as government institutions and CSOs. Uh, uh, in the Western Balkans. He holds MA in Human Rights and Democracy from the University of Sarajevo, University of Bologna. And currently he is enrolled on PhD program in Global Studies with the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of University of Sarajevo. So, Samuel, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Mario. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, it's going to be quite a task. Can I get my presentation on? Flickr is here, but it's not. So, yeah. It's going to be quite a task to actually squeeze in uh, five or six years of work in 20 minutes, but I'll, I feel I'm up to the task. So I'll see if I can actually. <laughs> 30 years, yes. Uh, well, I'm here to talk about this practical part. Somebody said, where is the hope? How do we move forward? Professor Yoller tends to actually have this uh, effect on the, the students, including myself, when I first time, when I heard him, you just shut down, it's too much. But then, of course, you have to move forward. And my story today is actually about moving forward how we try to move forward at least. And it's actually talk about the, the uh, group of interdisciplinary uh, researchers, scientists, uh, academics, activists that gathered around the idea that we can actually make a change in the education. And to be more specific, we still believe and we believe then that the uh, critical thinking is something that our education system in Bosnia and Herzegovina and everywhere in the world, you cannot have enough critical thinking is uh, seriously lacking and missing. So the ultimate tool for actually igniting this or increasing the, the level of critical thinking was the media and information literacy concept uh, on itself. But immediately we knew once my colleagues started researching that it's not just another subject in the schools because it just offered itself this idea, okay, we are gonna teach about media and information literacy as a separate subject and case is done, project over, everybody's happy. We develop curriculums and stuff like that. But then uh, uh, Mario was very persistent with his idea that that is not 
a separate subject. It is cross-curricular uh, cross thing. And then he added another layer by saying, and it is the, the center of the gravity is the library and librarian. Because the librarian is an information specialist. And if you are talking about the information and critical thinking, everything has to start from the, the, the place where it should be, library. And the main actor is librarian. So the motley crew of the researchers and the activists and the uh, academic uh, uh, persons gathered around what we call the scientific platform for media and information literacy. So if you talk about the platform, it's not actually a physical space. It's the it's rather about the people, about our minds congelling, if you will, and thinking about same things and pushing in the same direction. And we roughly, the platform had these uh, 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 areas in which we focused our work. Uh, it was, I'll actually go back. What we needed, we needed, of course, research. After that, we need to develop some, some uh, tools and then some content. And uh, we use different methods to actually test, implement, and see if they work. After that, we needed to, to actually inform the, the uh, decision-making processes through the new policies and adjustments of certain policies so that the education can accommodate our ideas. And then we are at the phase of actually thinking what is next, what is the future of the media information literacy. So regarding the, the research uh, with various type of activities that were conducted over, this is actually old number, it's around 1600, I think around 1,600 individuals that actually participated in various things that we did uh, regarding media information literacy throughout the Bosnia. Also, when I'm, when I'm talking about research, when we are talking about research, we are talking about empiricism. So it's not that it's one thing to collect the primary data through qualitative or quantitative means, but the other thing is to actually believe and do empiricism which is to actually uh, experience and observe what you are talking and studying about. And that's what we did. It wasn't just high theories. We actually went in and see, tested the ideas that we were coming up uh, talking about. Uh, okay, I'll manage with that. And of course we did that through focus groups, fine, through focus groups and feedbacks. And the, While doing that, we came with this model for integration of the media and information literacy in education system. It looks very uh, massive at first, but actually it's very, when you, when you actually spend 10 to 15 minutes actually uh, looking, really looking into it, it makes perfect sense. And the, the starting point was the what UNESCO did. And as you know, UNESCO is the, the, uh, the top authority regarding the education. They are uh, valued by all stakeholders. For example, when UNESCO says something about media information literacy, the uh, uh, EU actually acknowledges that. And then it makes these communications to the member states to adjust of course, they, they don't have to do that, but they recommend that they adjust their education as per UNESCO guidelines. So, of course, we, we took uh, their ideas about uh, media information literacy, but we saw that they are okay on its own, but that every country, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, needs its own model. And by doing all those things, we created this hybrid model of multi-stage integration of media information literacy. And the instrument itself was of the most importance with the uh, strategic development of media information literacy in Canton, Sarajevo, and Bosnia Herzegovina, which you will see later if I manage with the time. Yeah, so over 100 workshops everywhere. We did not just do the theoretical concepts, as I said, we tested them with baseline studies 
entry uh, uh, questionnaires, exit questionnaires, focus groups, then tweaking the, the theories that we were developing and so on. So lots and lots of people, lots of work. Then we had to develop content. As I said, UNESCO has the, the content that is overarching, the general guidelines and everything, but we need a specific things for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And not only that, the materials were purely in English. We did not opt to translate those, we developed our own. So there is a whole edition of the materials with the content that is Bosnia specific, Bosnia Herzegovina specific and region specific. We developed four, eventually we are gonna not stop there. We are gonna keep doing, working and the new one will be sometimes next year, I guess. The methods that are used by the hybrid, some of them you had the opportunity to, to hear about today. I wouldn't go too much into detail with this. Uh, for once, I don't have a time. And for two, I don't feel very comfortable talking about these models. That is the forte of Professor Mario. I'm more on this strategy level and public policies and stuff like that. So feel free to talk about, uh, to, to bother Professor Mario or Emir. Uh, next week when they, uh, tomorrow when he comes, because they love talking about this. They they talk all the time about this, <laughs> believe me. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the uh, beauties of this process. I learned a lot and I had 20 years of uh, experience, working experience, uh, uh, and the guided inquiry design is just a marvel on its own. And it's been used heavily by our by our model. Yes, in process, we developed also the Massive Open Online course. It's accredited by the uh, University of Sarajevo. It's the first such course. So if you have any uh, inkling of, if you actually would like to learn more about how we see the media information literacy in education systems, feel free to, to go through the Massive Open Online course. It has 12 uh, modules. They are very well structured structured with the original uh, content, uh, plus you can watch uh, Professor Mario on the endless loop on his videos and stuff like that. And with regarding the policy, we developed the model, the content, we've been to classrooms, we did this Empiria whole thing stuff, you know, the experience and all of it. And then with that knowledge, our platform did something that uh, academic platforms don't do. Usually, you know, the academia, they develop a theory, they tested it, sometimes maybe. And once that is completed, you kind of pull back and say, okay, the work is done. Because that is the, the, what the academia does, university do. We created science, develop something new, here it is. But we knew that the state of the, the uh, well, with any concept, you know, uh, the, the, actually the, this thing you, we can, I, I'll use the analogy. It's like your children. You develop, you created something new. You gave it certain, uh, values, uh, uh base, uh, uh, norms, standards. And then once the child grows up, it's supposed to, you know, you did your, the best you could. It's now has a life on its own. So once we, we were at this point, we were at the point where we could have said, okay, it's time for you to, to move out, you know, you are adult and uh, do your thing, you know. But we thought maybe the environment in which our child is going, our model is going actually, it's not as, it won't be as kind because we know that there are limitations to public uh, administration in every country, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we offered our help to actually do, to integrate this into the uh, policy area. I mean, into strategies, into budgets, into action plans, into guidelines and those things, in order to ensure that our baby actually gets a proper treatment. So we did that. We did lots of background papers, policy briefs, arguing why it's not the, the uh, separate subject on its own, it's cross-curricular, why library, why librarian, through the policy uh, language. And then we went even further and we wrote a strategy 
about the integration of media and information literacy uh, into area of education in Canton Sarajevo. I mean, talk about overprotective parent. We actually went full on here. We, we, we were holding that child by the hand. I mean, it's university time and you're still tucking it into a bed. But uh, we, we basically, we, we evaluated that it's, we just have to, to stick around for a bit longer. So the strategy has been uh, adopted this year. And then that was also a point where we could have said, okay, enough. But we said, okay, let's do the action plan. So we are actually doing the action plan with the specific measures with specific projects, with specific uh, 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 indicators that are going to measure is it successful or not. And we are in process of doing that and we are going to conclude that by the end of the year. And what else? Yes, we did the guidelines based on our five, six year experience of integrating our model into the education system. We created the guidelines and the principles for any other administrative body, I mean, canton, entity, uh, country, uh, and I'm not talking about Bosnia, they are made in such a way that they can be replicated as easily in Germany or in Montenegro or uh, Algier, uh, doesn't matter. So uh, that was pretty with the policy. So we are now in, a, in this thing of the, uh, the future and this should let go, I mean, now by, I think we've done our job, but something tells me that we are gonna keep uh, doing this because you have to understand this part. Coming from the, from if you are, if you put yourself in my shoes, being a, a social uh, science researcher, this is brilliant. You have the idea, which is yours, and you actually, you, you test the whole thing, you uh, give her life, through actual policies, uh, it's, 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 it's beautiful. It's once in a lifetime. I love that. So it's very hard to let go of good things, you know? I, 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 I know I should, but some, <laughs> I know I should, but I just can't separate myself from such a beautiful journey, story, thing. Uh, I mean, when you create, it's always nice. And we, as a scientist, we don't, especially in Boston, we don't have too much opportunities to actually do something that you uh, love. And in doing so, you actually create something useful and not just create, but you are actually are gonna disseminate that. So, so now we are probably, we are, we'll have to eventually let go, but I think we are gonna actually stick around for this uh, monitoring and evaluation, maybe some portion of it. And that's the meal plan, monitoring, evaluation, assessment, and learning. Because it's not just that we are going to create the, uh, the action plan, make sure that they actually do a proper thing with our baby. We are going to actually now create uh, uh, indicators, uh, tracking tools, uh, surveillance, to, to see that it actually performs in a way that we planned or that in a way that we hoped it will. And we, we are actually planning to do the, uh, that's the purpose of these plans, to actually tell you in a real time that something's not right. So we are gonna kind of try to tweak it back and forth and change it. And for the future, the one thing is certain now for Canton Sarajevo, we know all how the education systems are rigid and they're very, they're, they're dexterity uh, when the change is somewhere looming on the horizon is not really great, but we created a, a simple and elegant way to actually do that. And uh, I'm certain that, that the, 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 there'll be results and with, like with everything in education it takes a long time, but they will be there. So that's about it. I think I did it in in time, did I? Okay, that's so if you have any questions, please do do ask. Thank you, Sana. Uh, uh, whenever I hear this, let's say, genealogy of our <laughs> and short history of our 
uh, uh, activities. I always wonder, really, we did all this, so yeah, it's not possible. But uh, 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 when you uh, uh, meet Emir tomorrow and see his energy and passion uh, 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 working on this, uh, all this, uh, then you will uh, probably get the full picture of how it all went. Uh, uh, do, do you have any questions uh, for Sanal? I just want to one, one uh, important thing. It wasn't always uh, rosy. We didn't go like Teletubby style there. It was lots of arguments, fights, you know, there are opinions, confrontations, like, so it, it's been, you know, it's been very emotional uh, experience also. Yeah, that's why we call it praxis. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's so, complete praxis. So, Professor Tatiana? I just wanted to comment. I just wanted to make a comment. I think that the whole uh, whole idea and the work uh, on this project uh, has one uh, very important value, and this is that you have interconnected. Uh, so you have faculty of philosophy, you fa have faculty of political science, and this is something which uh, usually don't work in our, let's say, region. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, we uh, always have problems uh, in communication with other colleagues at the university, and it's very hard to break the boundaries between the disciplines. And I believe that one of the success of this project is laying exactly on this fact that you, uh, we are learning from each other yeah, and doing it together. This is just a comment. Uh, yeah, but honestly, it was not uh, 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 institutional. We, yeah. It was more on, on, on it our was, it's not... affinities between two researchers, two academics, two scholars uh, 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 to to actually join the passion and and uh, uh, the, uh, share those concepts in a way that uh, 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 <clears throat> covered even the, the 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 approaches within the education system, but also from the uh, part of the policies. So uh, uh, in, in that way, we really uh, managed to have uh, uh, to learn from each other, but also to share the the the, the, the same goal. And the 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 Maria said the key word passion. It's really because uh, it started as a tiny project. You know, this stuff is done despite of the project. <laughs> no, honestly, if we did the project, none of it would happen but the project gave us the the initial uh if you will i don't know like the it it enabled us to actually get together about a, a common cause which was to to conduct a project and then we realized that the sky is the limit and we believe that the uh like uh, uh that the despite the the uh, the the mountain of mountains, even the the ranges, if you will, of the the difficulties that are in front of us to actually come back to the the uh, to uh, more just and equal society that is uh, kind of disappearing from horizon every day a little bit more. It's further and further that there is a, a, a means for struggle and means for for fight, and of course you have to feel passionate about them. And I will just for for the end uh, uh, add something. Uh, uh, somehow the the the, the pandemic times uh, uh, get the focus uh, on our activities because we were uh, talking about e-learning, about the the new approaches in in the classrooms and methodologies, but like you know most of them just don't get it don't listen and you uh, repeat and uh, you, then you go into the circle but uh, uh, when pandemic started uh, uh, all eyes somehow were on media and information literacy and we already had models we already had content we are already we were finishing uh, uh, MOOC so suddenly we got a chance to talk to the uh, uh, teachers uh, uh, directly 
and they were in need for for uh, help and that's how we actually uh, uh, explained that it's not only about the, having the teams to not about having this uh, software or support but how to think about different uh, uh, teaching styles different methodologies in that new environment and that was actually uh, 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 maybe the, the the basic thing from which we then uh, re tried to reactualize the position of school library in a uh, interprofessional partnership with the teachers and that's uh, 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 as some really well structured uh, 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 in his speech we we take it as a, as a as a, a, as a uh, as a whole, as a concept that should be implemented as such, not just part of them. So hopefully the action plan won't uh, spoil the, the, the child. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so fingers crossed. Yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 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 now we have a, a, a two hour break and uh, please come back uh, uh, because we continue with, with, with really nice uh, and important presentations for all of us. Uh, okay, have a break, have a break. Oh, good start, sir. Yeah. Every year is getting slightly better. Yeah, <laughs> it's already very professional. Yeah, it looks very professional. Yeah. And how fitting that we talk about, uh, this is the first time that I'm thinking about what we did in a library, yeah. which is very oh, fitting. Yeah, yeah. Emir always mentioned that. I'll mention when we come back. It's the first time for me. So, let's have a coffee, huh? Uh, Are we eating here? Uh, Hello. This is Monday night. 
Thank you. Ah, I know the negative from the game. And I need that, yeah, yeah. What do you need to go back? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, it's foreign time, right? Perfect. Yeah. Ah, uh, female, female. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me just check the rest. Oh, sorry. German, I think. Croatia. Or maybe German too. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Ah, in pain? No, no, no. <laughs> so, so thank you. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, wonderful. Uh, 
And this is bus tickets, ne? Mm -hmm. Ah, excellent. Okay. Let's put Cornelia in here also. Probably a name. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. I can't get the ball. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, you like. I bet that maybe you did not count. Well, it would be better no, it's okay. unless it's a very small amount. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh huh. Yes, so it is there. 87. No, it would be it would be better if you send it in your in the new EU is not a problem. Now you will get it this year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, actually let's let's put it. Let's start it. Yes. Maybe we can do it even in one, then you and you give over to the We can leave you this because I am doing this. I am. Uh, I just need this return and we can copy it if you want. Yeah, that, it would be good. Here uh, I can ask how you will be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, then I give you all together. Then exactly. I copy it. So you don't yes, so while I prepare the okay. first thing. also i think it's also okay then you don't have to copy it yeah, yeah. and then you can put it on i can print it at home yeah, yeah. it's okay no problem mm -hmm. yeah yeah This I can Okay. <laughs> Names are there. Right, there's even a code, so it's uh, 
I better send you this information by email because I think you gave the sweet all that thing. Your swift big. No, 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 no. You don't have it here. No, but the rest you can already feel. Whatever you know, maybe. Whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Street address. You can sit down. That's right. <laughs> I Lots of information yes. require. Usually, this goes pretty quick. Yes. I was just using uh, the numerical. And this I will send you. No, no, it's the official address. Uh, we'll check and send an email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This. Or maybe it is. Do we find it on there? Can I get back to the hotel? I will connect in the hotel on my computer with my online banking and then I will get it tomorrow. Okay. And then and let's put the amount was in two times. Ah. Two times. Where did we do the calculations? Mm. No, it's on the paper, probably, which I Oh, which I took. The one that I didn't want to give you, so you don't Ah, ah. I think that's Copy. Good. Perfect. So it's not much. Ah. <laughs> Great. Okay, I will send you this with the and these numbers. Totally. Excellent. So already we have one. First. Oh, 
Fine, I think it's nice. No, did you like the conference so far? Oh, yes, yes, I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, 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 uh. I was actually very impressed by the first one. Yeah, I see one the first one was uh, very direct. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I could also accept them like all mm. these uh, um, something from the anonymous group, ninety nine percent It was very very interesting, mm. and um, actually he uh, did analysis, very deep, he did research actually, and uh, it's very comprehensive, very detailed, mm. and uh, it's animated also in the narration. Leads you to better understand uh, mm -hmm. how the mechanism functions. So, mm -hmm. very impressive. Very impressive. Very impressive. Very impressive. Actually, very really curious. I didn't ask for the board, but uh, very curious. Um, is what was the accommodation of this video and his work and comment over the last four years? Uh, because uh, he's been the example was presented, but I didn't understand whether only. In academic circles like the scientific congress, because this is a video displaying his scientific work, but it is at the same time uh, like a popular documentary. Exactly, it is in the style already, or uh, and it is um, uh, like a context with really is a of the popular message of science for the. Regular audience, exactly. Probably we'll join uh, for the dinner and stuff. Uh, yeah. And you are currently in Croatia, no? in Dalmatia. Well, actually, I was not in Croatia, uh, but in exchange. Oh, I, I see. Um, oh, going to Bavaria. Oh, oh, really? Oh, nice. And then coming back to Boston. So it's 
Actually, we just open it and then we're going to uh, uh, so uh, oh. yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. so That's Hezo is known as the smallest community in German hosting universities. Oh, I didn't know about this. Uh -huh. Which university is in German? It's uh, Wein Stefan. Wein Stefan. Yeah. Yeah, that's like life sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, interesting. Oh, nice. You have cooperation with them also. Yes. Ah, cool. Nice. Yes, we, we've been working with them since last year. Ah. Uh -huh. uh, we developed several projects together, and uh, they like to invite us to deliver courses and workshops. Ah, uh, they are uh, colleagues uh, from South Saharan African universities. I was, it was new for me that actually German, German university turned focus on the South Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. That's like a culture climate uh, change. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, I know that very nice. Oh, no. uh -huh. Great, oh, no. I know it's a definitely good time. It's a good time. And I'm driving. Ah, I'm driving. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah, I'll go for lunch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, it's uh, when you see, that's like the lyrics. Oh, oh, ah, then it's better to go directly, and it's very nice for the picture. Mm-hmm. Graz, very nice. Ah, Maribor, and then Graz. And then you go uh, from Belgrade to Zagreb. No, that's also now pretty good shape. No, no. no. I go. I know it until Osijek because I go a lot to the Osijek Connex. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and it's almost the same road direction. He's on the road. He's on the road, man. Like half time. He designed. Yeah, 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 it's in the north of Germany, close to Hannover, huh? and you know, like small, mid-sized university, eight thousand students. Uh, and this information of science. And, uh, well, the university is a lot focused on teacher education and the digital teacher, teacher education for primary schools. No, uh, I'm not in the area, but <laughs> but the main most of the half of the universities. Earlier, no, not 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 really. Uh, just uh, teacher for primary. So yeah, it's a pity that we didn't get this uh, racism project. No, it was very close. Uh, it's life. Difficult. It would have been a very nice group. And it seems there is no similar call this next year or something. So I don't know how it's going. Well, we'll see. Yes, yes. Expect that. Oh, yeah. I don't be surprised by that. By anything. Yeah, yeah, nowadays things can change quickly because we learned. So I think I'll grab a food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's going to look to you and ask again. I see it here.
Ali ja imam, ja imam samo, ima taj, ali ne znam ako ću ovo zapaziti. Da, leto, trebaš više onaj, nije duže zanima nego ima onaj sa volitima. Da, ali, nije sad prava ti interesa. Ali vidiš koji taj. Zato smo tu. Pa ne si napisala ovo tu. 
Okay, you start that you forget something about that. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. 
We're perfectly in time. <clears throat> Welcome back. Glad to see you uh, in our library. I really have to mention that this is a reading room of the uh, library, <laughs> Faculty of Political Sciences. So uh, we continue with the program. Uh, I'm happy that I'm in a position to introduce you my colleague is friend Buena Kostic, born in Belgrade, lives and works in Netherlands, where after a master's degree in information law at the University of Amsterdam, has been engaged in research and public representations in digital rights protection, intersectional justice, community capacity building, and peer support for 10 years. Through her work, she collaborated with international organizations from Council of Europe, UNESCO, OSCE, Free Press Unlimited, Thomson Reuters, Etc. as well as with local initiatives and communities such as Australia Lesbian Foundation, Share Foundation, Media Diversity Institute. Before that, she dealt with humanitarian rights and trials for, for war crimes and the protection of the human rights of marginalized groups. She believes in regulatory power of communities, solidarity and feminism. And uh, she likes poetry. She likes poetry, of course, <laughs> but uh, 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 now we're going to here, uh, some <clears throat> points over regulatory grief, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that we uh, uh, that you all came back. So, Bona, the floor is yours. Thank, thanks so much. Um, so, so I guess I need this pointer over there. I mean, the to just switch the slides, and maybe we can um, start with the slides. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much all for invitation. Thanks for getting back from your uh, lunch break. Um, what I'm going to do in the next half an hour, I'm going to try to present you something that started as a, as the title says, uh, kind of a, should kind of a focused on civil society um, role in setting the uh, media literacy infrastructure and agenda. But then as I went into the topic, as always, I became over ambitious. Uh, so then I expanded it. So first, uh, what we're going to do, as it says on the, what is in the focus, we're going to talk about these policies, these five policies, and then I'm going to try to kind of uh, present you a personal and professional uh, regulatory grief uh, concept, which is actually recently been also discussed in a wonderful paper by Julie E. Cohen, where she actually talks about five levels of regulatory, I mean, she calls it like a legal dramas. Uh, I call it regulatory grief. Actually, this is how our institutions, and by institutions, I I don't mean only state actors uh, or non-state actors. It's a, it's a kind of a, like a common space where we practice certain um, governance models, regulatory models, and so on. So they're not necessarily either public or private. They're more or less joint uh, activities, endeavors. As such, uh, they're not really close to our legal tradition, which usually comes from industrial era, which is super centralized, it's bottom up, so on. Uh, so it's top down. Uh, here we have a whole completely different set of uh, notions that we will try to discuss from the perspective, not only how the media information literacy uh, seen as a governance model is changing our views of governance, institutional uh, cooperation, partnerships, and so on, but also how the same disruptions are actually at the institutional and governance level are happening due to technological uh, dynamics and changes. So there's going to be kind of a three uh, 
um, layers of discussion here. Uh, just to start with, um, uh, where where do I? <laughs> I can change it on my laptop, but not there. Here, yeah. Uh, so basically, because we are here as a as on an academic kind of um, exercise here, I want to make sure just to make sure that I'm not actually working in academia. I'm an independent researcher. So as Vladan was saying, I sit somewhere in between different fields of studies and sciences, but I also sit somewhere in between different. Uh, institutions, projects, and so on. Most of the uh, most of the work that, or the most of the part of this uh, lecture, is basically based on my personal uh, insights and oversights through the years and engagement of, on different uh, media literacy and media freedom and freedom of expression projects. Where in the region, specifically, specifically that I'm now focusing on, I had a um, well, pleasure, sometimes pleasure, sometimes not, pleasure, not so much pleasure uh, to, to talk, to interview, intervene in different legislative institutional changes and processes. So that's one way of looking at what we are, I'm now talking about, or I will be talking about. The other way is through uh, a problem of reductionism and oversimplification. So just to make sure that these are not so to say, methodologically solid steel frameworks, and this is not an academic exercise at the end of the day. Uh, besides the lack of uh, methodological solid frameworks and, re and right uh, choices and the indicators for these choices, there is also a problem of, that I discussed with Safet uh, during the break, actually we do, we do not have such a wealth of literature that goes into these new governance models, these new institutional cooperation models, this top-down, but at the same time centralized, decentralized, somewhere in between, and then all, this, all the things that we like to talk about, correction mechanisms, control mechanisms, and so on. So basically the scope, as I said, is going to be uh, affordances and values and infrastructure of um, CO, CO, so civil society meal interventions, so which are actually partly and predominantly uh, taking place in the Western Balkan region. And then what we can learn from Lex Informatica, um, and I, I'm gonna define it later, on disruption models about multi-stakeholder governance. As I said, information uh, collection, or basically some kind of a disclaimer, is basically there is a part that I did with interviews with stakeholders during the, all these projects that I've been involved with. And there is a lot about personal insight. So as I said, there is a, a, a sort of a personal bias directly involved in all what I'm gonna be talking about. Just briefly, uh, yeah, just briefly, uh, what I mean by uh, media literacy in this lecture is defined there, and you all know the, all of these definitions, there are many of them, but I just want to say that in the research that I'm, I've been working on for the last five years when it comes to media literacy, uh, I kind of came up with two different concepts uh, that I like to kind of emphasize at the beginning. One is this kind of an educational pillar that you are all experts in, and I'm not. Um, and there is another pillar, which is a governance model pillar, which is kind of a very, very we talk about all of these things that I will be discussing here, we actually see that it's a model that requires, a, so to say, successful or a meal interventions and uh, inter uh, intersectorial and interdisciplinary uh, cooperation and partnerships are those that are kind of at the heart of uh, kind of a meal um, governance models. And as always, uh, any governance models, including the one that is that implicates a media literacy activities, programs, public policies, always comes with a certain power relationships uh, that very, where the actors need to not only define the governance models, but also need to define their own roles, their, uh, their responsibilities, they need to be correction mechanisms, and so on. So this is still something here in the region that we are not really capable of grasping. And usually we try to borrow the knowledge from uh, the regions that have more interest or more uh, ability of working in these kind of environments, which is not always the case for us. Uh, so uh, before we go into these uh, fallacies, as I mentioned, uh, that I mentioned in the, in the title of the lecture, uh, let's just quickly go over the current situation when it comes to our characteristics of our governance mill uh, infrastructure in the region. Um, so despite the fact that there is a solid uh, regulatory framework, 
uh, there is always a problem of uh, lack of actual meaningful substantive involvement of those hierarchies that we call like to call them those political elites and so on. So here the male goes into this transformative process of not being understood seriously as a meaningful set of um, substantive measures kind of to introduce different kind of uh, curriculums, different kind of interventions, and so on. So here is another part then that comes from that is actually a problem of uh, lack of coordination. So there are all there are different actors working in a non-linear manner. They are absolutely not coordinated. They're usually not even aware of their existence of each other. And even when they try to do uh, things together, and we will see in the next stage, uh, in the next slide, uh, they usually have a problem of designation and responsibility. Uh, and this, all, uh, as always, comes with the problem of the pre-information uh, 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 revolution era when we when we kind of uh, when our institutions were actually built to work in a different era. It is industrialization era where there was not only a centralization, but the power dissemination was kind of a very well um, accommodated. It's certain kind of a, yeah, ministries or certain uh, levels of organization. Here we see that there is a, a different level that requires engagement of various sectors at the same time. And therefore it's also comes as a result of uh, media literacy nature as a seen as a governance model, just to make sure I'm clear here. Uh, basically, the problem there is actually that the media information literacy has this uh, no, uh, nature of transition. So basically, it's, kind of, it's also kind of a liquid. So basically, it starts being an a, a issue of Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture, but then it soon goes down and drops down to the level of civil society organizations and so on. So def definitely, it requires engagement of different actors. They're interdependent. They, they not only need to work together, they need to plan together, implement together something that uh, usually requires uh, horizontal uh, sharing of responsibility where, or sometimes even vertical a bit, but still that's something that is not really in our legislative and institutional uh, traditions. Uh, so here are the fallacies that I've noticed in my five years of work specifically on the male uh, issues and more broadly 20 years of working in the civil society sectors on the issue of media freedom, freedom of expression. Uh, as Mario mentioned, I worked for a number on a number of projects simultaneously, and most of them are connected by just notion of freedom of expression, digital rights, uh, internet freedom, and so on. And here, uh, I want to mention something that kind of uh, comes very logical from the previous slide, where I kind of uh, um, draw out for you or lay out for you kind of a macro perspective, right? Like what the institutions are not actually doing. And as I said, institutions, it's kind of a wider system of uh, organizations and actors working together. So here is what is happening now in the region. So what we got is a project-based mill uh, ad hoc interventions. It's like, even when you come up with the most wonderful strategy, it will be, it will tear down, it will be broken down into several project activities, indicators, and so on. Uh, so there is a lack of understanding that every mill intervention is actually has a macro effect immediately. So this is not like a random sampling thing that we do, uh, and it has a systematic societal effect. Regardless of its project nature, it has an impact on individuals and the groups that we are trying to focus on. Uh, one other aspect of the problem here um, is that... Uh, usually it's a random sampling, like who are the targets that we are working with, especially it's also a problem with the interventions and the value and the logic of the uh, activities that we are trying to implement within CSO project based ad hoc interventions. So here comes another problem. Um, what I've noticed is actually that even the organizations that have as a, their kind of a major um, uh, um, I'd, like that they have a meal, in, meal activities as a part of their portfolio in a, in a predominant way, usually they do it as a side activities, right? They're not, we cannot, I, I mean, maybe I'm, and, and again, this is a personal insight. So if there are organizations that are doing things differently, good for them. But uh, for now, what we are seeing is that uh, most of the activities are taking apart as a side curriculum, as a side um, set of interventions. 
So we do not have like a, what we would what, what would you think of, what would you think about some kind of a systematic a structured approach with a, where we have a trainers where we have a system of activities that we want to implement the way we're going to do it what kind of outcomes we want to see how we finally evaluate our approach what kind of values are um, uh, ingrained in these activities are we talking about consumer uh, like uh, digital consumerism and how we produce more content and so on or are we talking about critical thinking uh, and about the content or we talk about completely third set of things which is actually something that Lalan was talking about like a broader picture and putting our our individual poor souls in these uh, cost <laughs> biopolitical domains uh, so uh, as I said, for many, many years, uh, uh, media literacy was a donor's darling, and uh, it is a way of like, it is, that's why we ended up having completely externally funded media interventions and why no governments feel like invited to allocate their budgets, annual budgets. Uh, on these interventions in a more systematic way. Uh, and this is also done by the state institutions, don't get me wrong. This is the same model is implemented by mo most regulatory authorities in the region. They are also applying for the projects, the same one that CSOs are trying to get. So it's a kind of a, a same uh, same thing the other way around. Uh, 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 yeah, my favorite uh, one is that the media literacy is not the political sensitive issue, and def therefore everyone can introduce their own interventions, their own ideas about it, and so on. Uh, that's why we have an expertise that is usually, first of all, that's why there is a discomfort partnership, <laughs> because we, we kind of, uh, we try, tend to kind of, uh, um, kind of to build this kind of a narrative as a media literacy, as a non-political, it's about education, it's about well-being of individuals, it's an art of living in the digital society and so on, which is all true. Uh, but there is a part to it that we kind of tend to avoid. And that's why without addressing it, we cannot have open and under and kind of a meaningful partnership between civil society, public institutions, private actors, and all those who are actually uh, uh, right now taking part in this broader mill infrastructure. Um, another one is again that I mentioned is like this problem of, and this is not something only happening in the region. This is very uh, kind of a global issue. And uh, this is about, this is on uh, the focus here on mill interventions is mostly about on producing the content and about uh, building the, or ensuring or strengthening the existing digital skills, right? So to, to kind of reach this goal of employability. Let me give you an example here. It comes from Serbia. Most of the strategies for the development information society, uh, AI, um, digital, um, something like a digital economy or something like there are all different strategies. They all address media literacy uh, in one of their segments. And one of the segments usually is about like building certain skills. And they're always and always this kind of market driven logic of uh, employability, like how we kind of make sure that each one of us knows how to code and sooner or later is going to work in a Silicon Valley. Perfect. We outsource this back to Serbia on a poor labor. Wonderful. We all work for Facebook, but from Serbia, uh, ideal situation for for a market for a liberal markets um so and then even when we kind of uh, move away from that extreme and we kind of want to find a kind of this bargaining balanced uh, position we end up in this uh, world of uh, ad hoc interventions that are like I remember in 2020, 21, there was a whole hype about verification resources. Like we need to verify the sources. So I re I remember being asked by a number of IOs like to come up with a with a repository of initiatives that try to kind of a uh, um, 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 foster the skills of like or or the knowledge of and and the knowledge of like how individuals can verify the resource and know what is true or not and so on and all of these verification led us to um, COVID and all these things really proved out to be there that they're definitely insufficient. And then uh, when we talk about, uh, so to say, um, expertise and knowledge building and this, um, and the mill, like a place of mill in this 
in this kind of a world of fallacies and discomfort of and this is comfort partnerships what we see here is that there is a lack of understanding that the media literacy is actually has this double flux that i mentioned at the beginning so that without this broader understanding of all the agencies and human and non-human agencies and our kind of a connectedness and or disconnection uh we tend to kind of uh build the knowledge in silos and we kind of uh basically step on on out each other's foot right instead of like having to kind of a think about together about what kind of a meal interventions we want to have in the country and it goes back and it refers both to the countries that have some kind of a solid uh jointly decided and developed strategy uh which is not a goal in itself it's just a mean right uh and those that don't like that don't have any kind of a strategy like bosnia or at the, at the kind of a a more higher political uh, level. So with this, we go into something that, so the idea, initial idea was for me to stop here. <laughs> but then I felt like, hmm, no, I read this great article that I mentioned. And then I was like, finally, like somebody defined all the stages of regulatory grief. So what I'm going to try to do now, I don't know how much time, I still have 10 minutes, beautiful. So what I'm going to try to do now, um, I'm going to talk more about the changes and disruptions into this inter-institutional cooperation that the mill is based on, is rooted on in as a governance model, but also in, the, in parallel with uh, the ways the technology itself, like the one that Vladan was talking about, this whole process that Vladan was describing, actually disrupt our institutional practices and legislative regulatory framework. So it's going to be kind of a double um, uh, parallel story. And if you get, if I get lost, or if you get lost, just raise your hand and we kind of try to fix fix it or find a way back. Um, so uh, as I said, it's not only about these fallacies. So if there are other disruptions happening, as I said, uh, we have a whole, uh, and then I, I, again, I won't go into the field, into what Waldemar was saying, because this is pretty much uh, that we've been here talking about and griefing uh, for, for, for a decade. So basically two other forces need to be taken into consideration, not only this multi-stakeholder mass that I was describing, but also like a technological disruption at the same time, and the fact that mill is uh, a matter of power and the governance and the new models that need to be, not new, but the different models that need to be elucidated to respond to the up to these three levels, let's say, I mean, there are many more, but let's focus on these three that need to be taken into consideration. There are kind of standing um, uh, kind of a, in contrast with what we consider to be tradition, legal tradition, legal histories, regulatory models that are usually centralized and so on. So what we are seeing as a governance regimes, changes in the governance regimes due to these disruptions that I was mentioning are actually uh, three kind of different layers um, of irony. Uh, so one is from uh, change from vertical to horizontal uh, decision-making. So this is where we got the, this kind of a linear, um, joint decision making processes interinstitutional cooperation and so on uh then from this in centralized to semi or fully decentralized models uh and then here we have a problem of responsibility deficit deficit problems of many hands uh what kind of a correction mechanisms something everything that was previously coming from the rule of law right principles and uh uh and constitutions and human rights and so on everything that was kind of a being being built within our institutions to make sure that the power does not exceed its um uh, uh big that, that does not corrupt us all right uh as, as i said responding to these challenges right uh, requires both panoptic and synoptic uh, understanding of the of the this new algorithmic society and mill interventions as a as a governance model and a part of it um what i mean by uh lex informatica just before we proceed uh is actually this encounter right between the between the network digital technologies and law right more broadly and 
And specifically, we can look as a lawyer, uh, we always talk about these kind of three levels of uh, legislative disruptions. So we talk about changes within the existing uh, legal frameworks, right? Like very directly the laws, but whether it's on a European level, on a national level, on a regional level, like they are the kind of the normative changes, right? And then there are institutional changes, like the level also the granularity of the information that uh, is being produced on a, on a daily level also makes different from the institutions. So they can come have a different outcomes and so on. There is a whole field of science, legal science, looking at this specifically. But there is also like the core, like the changes within the core of the logic of the justice. And that's the rule of law, kind of where the rule of law kicks in. But we don't want to go there now. It's for now, it's important just to fix, fix, kind of figure out what, the, what this concept of Lex Informatica stands for. So here we come to my favorite part. Uh, so let me give you a background of the of the term regulatory grief. Uh, this summer we were enjoying ourselves in the digital rights was in Perast. And uh, because it was about digital rights, you guess there were a lot of talks about legislation, European uh, regulatory storm coming from the from the Brussels, the DSA Act, the DMA Act, EU AI Act, Media Freedom Act, GDPR, and blah, blah, blah. And what happened uh, is that uh, after listening a lot about and reading and writing about and being asked to kind of comment on it on so many in so many blogs and la la. What happened is that I figured out actually like what I was kind of uh, uh, trying to do and be a part of all these years was kind of a, just a lacmus paper, like uh, just for to make sure that at the end of the day, all of our efforts serve the same one purpose. And this is the purpose to kind of strengthening the duopoly between the states and, uh, and the corporations, big tech. So what we're seeing now is actually the in the future and I will stop here because this is something that I can talk about for forever. So uh, it's about actually shifting the power from the states to the companies and then from the companies to the states and making sure that or making sure. And then by doing this, making the, the gap between those on power and those that are uh, under like like citizen stuff is even getting bigger. So with the less mechanism of control, with less mechanism of correction and so on. So that's why I think that at this point, these mill governance models or any other models that kind of sit in between these two, in these individuals and institutions and this duopoly of power um, are maybe not a places of hope, <laughs> uh, but they're for sure a ways of thinking about like introducing some kind of a check and balances um, in the system. So here are these, uh, oh, okay, fine. So this is a point, these five regulatory, uh, these uh, stages of regulatory grief, uh, I did not come up with for sure, uh, but Julie Cohen in her work uh, wrote about them as through the lenses of Lex Informatica. So how te disruptive technological um, uh, artifacts, processes and systems uh, change, transform, modify our understanding of legal institutions and governance models. And so what I'm gonna do next, I'm just gonna go quickly through all of these stages. Uh, by looking at mill governance model, right? Um, so denial is basically where we were for a very long time, even when it comes to media, media literacy as an infrastructure and governance model. Uh, basically, we were all hoping that we kind of build our institutions so far so strong that they are able to kind of resist the disruption and we can all just sit back and everything will be just fine. Um, and the same happened with technology, right? For many, many years, we were like, oh, it's fine. It's just internet. It's decentralized. It's just a freedom, technologies of freedom and so on. And this is, was a period that kind of ended very quickly and uh, abruptly with when the anger kicked in, where we actually figured out, oh, no, we are losing the control, right? So then we decided to be like, uh, do we need actually a system of governance? Uh, deregulation is a way to go about it. And nowhere is that better visible than in the field of copyrights and IP, uh, where we kind of let everything to be appropriated by the by the companies and their technologies. And then info, information science kind of a relevance of info, information science started to kind of a drop down. Um, and in the con context of media literacy as a governance model, what we see there in the model in, as a matter of, of anger, uh, 
it's like the, the, the institutions, both state and non-state and other actors are actually not willing to, because of this kind of anger, right? They're not really willing to work together. They're fighting around the same funds. They're, they're not actually distributing or disseminating the information. So we also have information asymmetry there as a problem and so on. Uh, and then the stage where we are currently in, both through a regulatory and institutional perspective is bargaining. And, uh, I, I believe that this is a moment where my regulatory grief actually kicked in uh, because this is the moment where we kind of uh, are just thinking about tweaking our practicing, just kind of a giving a bit of in and out for the technology, in and out for this and that intervention. And we can now kind of a, go back to denial and pretend that nothing is actually happening. Uh, and uh, in the, the context of... Uh, in the context of mill and the network uh, or the governance models, uh, bargaining is actually not taking place because here everybody's keeping their own uh, kind of a power positions. Everybody's thinking about the vertical hierarchies and that there are no uh, there are no this uh, horizontal disparities. But plus, what is also interesting here is there is a lack of good faith negotiations. Like maybe we have never learned about like how we do it uh, because we didn't have to, because industrial revolution, uh, revolution had its own uh, negotiation actors, powers where we were not invited to take a place in. So let's, I mean, it's still open for a discussion, right? And then here comes depression. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm past that, base, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, that it's a uh, that the effective control is out of reach, and again, I think that the, what we're gonna see in the, in the future, when all the regulation of the internet and uh, big tech comes from the European Union, but also from the, across the ocean, we're gonna see that the bargaining did not work out, and that we actually again missed the opportunity to introduce some effective corrective mechanisms and democratic mechanisms for control. Uh, but again, we are not there yet. So once the question is also a part where all these models that we and um, we all came across, it's like a corporate social responsibility out um, uh, this Facebook board, uh, oversight Facebook board is a part of this depression moment of like, oh, well, let's do something about it, right? Uh, and mill is there exactly like it's about like well we don't know what to do we are just a state it, this is this is got, comes this falls under the jurisdiction and competence of different institutions different ministries well we'll just leave it to the civil society organization and then we're gonna go after and complain that they're not doing a good job and so on so in the context of acceptance uh I'm not sure we are there yet uh but um and I I wish I could have some good examples here uh, maybe I mean I, I for sure there are for sure but I'm not aware of them because this is something that actually I wanted to share with you just because of this regulatory grief uh stages <laughs> um but acceptance should be a moment where we kind of finally figure out uh, and we all raise the awareness about the algorithmic society we are living in and the control and dystopian futures and entropias and everything that we are uh, uh, bragging about for a decade. Um, and, then, and then we kind of start to think about actual governance structures that are not based on solutions because there are no, sol there is, there are no solutions as such. They have this good faith negotiation and they are, they are value-driven models. So to get there, what we need to fix or what we need to kind of reconsider as uh, as social scientists, as some people coming from humanities, as activists and civil society actors, as journalists, as individuals, as parents, as poets and whatnot, uh, we need to kind of start thinking about what are these institutions, and again, I don't mean just by state here, um, that are optimized for this nectar information system. Like, and these, how do we, put under the, the the auspices of our our I mean kind of a social power right these different points of control failure modes everything that we've been kind of talking about when we discuss the algorithmic uh, societies uh, we finally need to accept that this assumption uh, that uh, there is a corrective societal mechanism and that it's still working will be able to control the this uh, agonies of predictability and optimization uh again there is a this keeps coming back and back and back this multi stakeholderism this multi governance levels uh, interdependence of different actors and so on 
not only as a result of tech disruption, which for sure led partly to that, but it's also a model actually that we need to acknowledge that the previous models of centralized uh, control are not working, are actually not, not they're working, that they're broken. They're actually being uh, completely uh, assimilated or integrated with the power of the platform. So we need new models of thinking about it. Um, and then learning from other disciplines. This is an also good one. Like that's why I'm telling you, I'm never, I'm not really sure that using describing myself as a legal tech researcher or anything makes any sense for me anymore because I feel like I'm sitting between so many different disciplines. Uh, and yeah, it has to be a iterative process where we kind of go back to assessing our resilience, our durability, uh, whether it's a right governance formation or we need to change it, and so on. So this is all from me. Uh, I I mean, I, oh uh, yeah, 33 minutes. Yeah, you're perfect <laughs> to, to what we discussed as well. <laughs> I said 33. Uh, she gave me 33 minutes, but I'm going to give myself five more. <laughs> if you, <laughs> so if you have, I mean, instead of me wrapping this up, uh, because there is so much to wrap up because this is an, an a per, like a, so to say, like a personal epistemic exercise. Uh, so I want to give you a floor too. And um, I'm really sorry if this was too quick. And if I overwhelmed you with, um, with uh, uh, information and the amount of uh, personal insights. Uh, but yeah, I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you, Brian. Do we have questions? So, so you mentioned doing stuff or doing media literacy the right way. What would be the, the right way of uh, well, if, you, if you listened carefully, you would hear that I'm not at an acceptance level of the regulatory regime. <laughs> but, but just to like uh, uh, toot my own horn and invite you all to come tomorrow morning to hear <laughs> maybe you about the right way of the right way of learning media literacy. No, but I, I'm curious about. So we hear a lot, or we often discuss uh, topics related to uh, to media literacy as non-functioning and and failing. But I would just like to hear some. I'm not going to say positive thoughts, but some <laughs> ideas that that are that are more aimed towards uh, towards the right way of, of mm -hmm. handling these or approaching, developing uh, these issues. Maybe like fragments you yeah, don't yeah, have yeah. to. So, thanks. I mean, um, here it's really funny because I'm talking uh, to Mary a lot about it. Uh, I mean, for me, there is um, a moment of media and information literacy as a, also a model of, when we talk about actual interventions, right? About activities and stuff. Um, that are now CSO led uh, and not as a governance model. There, I would really hope to hear and see more on uh, like a personal and collective resilience and pushback against, the, or not against, but just a pushback as a way of thinking about technologies, right? Not only about understanding the algorithmic society and our role in it and dwelling about, again, back to loving, uh, but um, it's about disobedience a bit at this point. So my question, my answer to your question would be, uh, education was not only, or should not only be about uh, doing things right. It should also be about bravery. So, like how to be brave, how to act, how to intervene, how to fight back. So I always wonder like where we, where did things go wrong when now in Serbia they can place around all these cameras for facial recognition, actually there is no one to uh, go and distract them, right? Where are these young people like who kind of us should rebel and fight against uh, the totalitarian technological, um, I <laughs> Sister, maybe I should do it. <laughs> how, to be, how to be prudent. <laughs> uh, before I uh, say thanks for, for uh, having you here. And, thanks for uh, having I, me. I really enjoyed uh, uh, your presentation and your speech because uh, 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 you had a chance here to uh, show up as independent researchers. So uh, uh, it's really... Uh, 
uh, uh, fits the the also the goal of our uh, 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 conference because we really wanted to have a different uh, perspective, different voices, not just to uh, uh, hold this content in academic uh, 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 circles. So uh, I would just uh, add one more comment because uh, uh, I guess uh, we heard Vladan uh, this morning in some kind, uh, if, if I may call him and label him another <laughs> Uh, the mention of his work, like a, a reverse architect of the explorer, <laughs> yeah, the regulatory grief, and now we heard uh, 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 about the regulatory griefs. So, so it seems that contemporary uh, uh, MIL visions and practices fail to recognize the necessity and urgency of new epistemologies. So, how mm. how would you comment on that? Oh, that's such a sad question. Mm. Actually, I really don't know. Like sometimes I feel like, oh, we've seen it all. We could just go back to past and pick up the things that were there and just kind of uh, lift them up and kind of push for them. But as I said, this is such a non-linear, non-evolutionary, uh, disruptive uh, process that 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 I still feel like what I was saying. I still feel like we are not there yet. We cannot think about next steps. I know it sounds bizarre because we've been all talking about this for, for a decade, right? And reading and being fully immersed in it. And then you still don't see the kind of, uh, uh, like what you're saying, like how you kind of uh, introduce this core component into a broader educational MIL setting, right? Like, so no, I don't know, is the, is the only answer I have. Okay, I, I hope to hear one. After so many discussions, <laughs> I'm kidding you. Uh, thank you, Brian, again. Thank you. And thank you we continue with the program. And Obviously, no, no, no. <laughs> now uh, uh, we're going uh, uh, in a slightly different uh, direction because uh, 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 maybe you. Uh, 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 noticed that we uh, started our, our our program actually on on Monday when the uh, uh, group of students from Hildersheim, actually six of them, with Pro Professor Joachim Grisbaum came to Sarajevo to have a workshop with uh, uh, students from the region, two from Montenegro, two from Serbia, two from Croatia, and two for. Bosnia and they have been busy uh, 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 three for three days uh, having a workshop with Professor Grisbaum. So now we are going to uh, uh, see you and hear uh, uh, what they came out with. And uh, I invite uh, first Professor Grisbaum to take a floor and then uh, I, I'm not sure how they uh, uh, agreed, uh, uh, how they are gonna deliver the results of their workshop, but uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that Joachim is more than uh, happy to to introduce you to the, the to, to, to what for, has been happening last three days. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you very much, Nalino. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, before... Before we start, I invite all the instructors who have been active this week also to come here. Slowly but surely. Okay, large number of um, instructors. Now we um, swift a bit the, the agenda, I guess, or not the agenda, but the topic. Now it's all, all about teaching and learning. And since a few years, we follow, or, yeah, we follow the idea that it could be worthwhile in information literacy education to bring together people from different locations, especially students from different universities in different countries, different cultures, give them tasks to on uh, yeah tasks related to information literacy. And the idea is that these students with diverse backgrounds 
from different countries, from different cultures, get in discourse and create knowledge. And we hope, and that's our experience so far, that they have a great learning experience. And always the end and the high point of the whole endeavor is that the students share their knowledge with the world. And this is now what's happening in this mm -hmm. session. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And it's also the first kind of, yeah, the first type of this kind of um, learning endeavor that we are doing partly non-online, partly in real life, in co-presence here. We have been working, and in, 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 was my was her saying, in Sarajevo for three days now. Please, students, show yourself so that all of the audience knows who was involved. And students created some, some artifacts, which are, I guess, uh, create uh, knowledge pieces. And these are the things that are presented now. We have a mixture of um, Hildesheim presentations and Sarajevo presentations. And um, maybe I hand over to Stefan and so that he and following that, the others can shortly introduce themselves. Thank you very much, Joachim, for this great um, introduction already. Yeah, so um, as you already um, heard a little bit about it, um, this this workshop here was not the only part. So um, we also have um, a broader course currently going on in Hildesheim, a project course also taught by Professor Hille, uh, Chris Baum together with me, where students work on information and inf meta literacy on a broader perspective. And there will be also an international collaboration in the second part with um, students from the United States. Uh, and India um, and um, also of Bosnia. And here um, at this first point or at this, uh, the beginning of the seminar, the students now focused also on specific topics, on foundations of information and literacy, information and meta literacy applied to specific contexts and also on foundations of creating open educational resources. So, um, and they did this at home at Hildesheim also during this week. So this was a kind of um, yeah shared working also. And today we will start then with um, these students from Hildesheim presenting online so they, we will hear some online presentations too. And then in the second part, we will hear what uh, our students here achieved. And yeah, also we'll hear more about the learning task. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe a short introduction. Yeah, so I will hand over to the next. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm Hannah Mitera. I'm also from the University of Hildesheim, um, working there as a PhD candidate and research assistant. And I have um, also uh, have been here for the workshop in Sarajevo the um, last three days. And uh, yeah, we tried to um, get a good overview of the topic of um, online um, educational resources for um, three different um, topics and also from Hildesheim on a more like general overview how that can be taught and um, yeah we hope we have some good results for you um, yeah that's basically it you want to add something <laughs> I'm back um, I should have said I'll be back uh, uh, Mario already introduced me. Thank you, Mario. Uh, uh, it was a very good experience, actually. I I enjoyed it because I learned quite a few things myself as an instructor. Uh, that is uh, always a welcoming thing to learn new things and uh, new people. And I'm certain that the students had a very good time and that they also learned uh, quite a few things. So. That's all. And thanks to the uh, fellow instructors. Uh, I think uh, this whole uh, idea will uh, certainly has a future and we are going to make sure, I guess, that it will continue and uh, that the program thrives and students with it. That's all. All right. Thank you. That was also kind of marketing. So if anyone is interested in joining. <laughs> Thank you, Joachim. Thank you all. Um, okay, I will stand up. Um, most of you know me. My name is Amina Adlovich, uh, similar as Sanel, senior researcher at the Institute for Social Science Research, Faculty of Political Sciences. Um, 
I actually switched the faculties. I finished Faculty of Philosophy, Department for Comparative Literature and, and Librarianship slash Information Science. Um, I started um, participating in these workshops as a student uh, when I was still a student. And now this summer I had an opportunity to uh, contribute as an instructor. Uh, and uh, this time in Sarajevo is my um, second workshop. And I think uh, when we finish with everything, it will be uh, very interesting to, to compare uh, all these um, similar, similar but uh, yeah, also slightly different uh, models because this was first time that we were doing this face-to-face um, -face, uh, live and it um, was not so long. It lasted only for three days. Um, so uh, thank you all and especially thanks for students. Thank uh, I also want to thank to all uh, of uh, other instructors who put a lot of effort into this. And uh, we are already talking about the possible models of um, of how to continue this and also how to include uh, students uh, who are with us. Um, well, I cannot say all these years, but all this time. So uh, thank you. And now we continue with the best part. Yeah, thank you very much so much for the context. So and what as the program. We have six presentations, three from Hildesheim and three from Sarajevo. We start with basics of information literacy, 10 minutes so that we are all on the same page, I guess, I hope, but um, yeah, maybe we are not the beginner audience. Then we cover current issues. The third group in Hildesheim talks about open educational resources. And then we switch to Sarajevo live presentations. And the, the overall topic of the workshop, live workshop here was um, how to inform oneself in times of crisis. We had three topics, climate change, um, COVID-19, some said it's already over, mm, we will see. And uh, with regard to the third topic, war in Ukraine, we already had some lively discussions, I would, I would uh, say. And without further ado, um, bear with us, with us if there are any, yeah, a few seconds because of technical uh, difficulties, but um, yeah, uh, it's, it's hybrid, we, we try it. So please, first group in, in, in Hildesheim, enter the stage, please show your pictures. Ah, okay. Um, type, in chat. type in chat and the one who will present will answer. And I will maybe moderate first, second, and so everyone um, has its role. We wait a few seconds. Chat is not activated. Well, that probably is Anna's. That is, she maybe does be presented. Anna Zadetsky? Yes. Yeah, Anna Zadetsky, the presenter, writes. Don't go on. Hello. Hello. Can you see us? Yes, I can see you and I can hear you, but I need a moment, please, because, um, yes, I am searching for the presentation now. All right. I cannot see you, unfortunately. Uh, uh, you cannot see me? No, I cannot see you. Okay. Fine. But hearing is more important at the moment than seeing you. Okay. This is Ms. Selitsky. S-E-L. Oh, no. uh, 
camera at least switched on. I'll give you a chance. And now you can activate your camera. Uh, one moment. <laughs> um, can you also activate my other group mates? So Melina Geig, Michelle Theis, uh, Sarah Afflerbach, and Laura Krautze. Maybe they can type their names in the chat so the the or it's given me whenever. Yes, okay, one moment. <clears throat> Yeah, online we know, offline we know, but hybrid is difficult. Melina Guy, the first. Ah, okay. There is a suggestion. Anybody who's in the group should use the raise hand uh, thing. And, and, and ah, okay. Yeah, this is a better solution, I think. Good idea. <laughs> Um, I hope you can see my um, desktop. Yes. So, so you can see the slides, right? Yes. Group okay. of intercultural aspects of information that you see and and the names are also there. So um, we are waiting for um, Zara. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. We don't see any picture of you. Okay. Um, I can't show my video because of the host, so I need the rights. I don't no, need that. To give you the rights. So, yeah, that was the same for me this morning. <laughs> okay. Sarah is also here. Okay, but I can't activate my camera because of the host. I'm not the host right now. Okay, I'd say it, but we skip maybe the, the technical stuff and we can work on it. I guess please start. <laughs> yes, okay. Laura, your part. Yes, hello everyone. Sorry for the technical issues. Can you hear me? I hope so. Yes. Um, today we'll present you the basics of intercultural aspects of information literacy and meta literacy. First, uh, we broadly define the terms information literacy and meta literacy. Furthermore, we will cover the characteristics, domains, and goals of meta literacy. And in the end, we will talk about the multilingual and multicultural aspects. So what is information literacy? To give a very short overview, IL is the set of abilities that is needed to recognize, locate, and evaluate information and to use it effectively. And the main goal is to enable learners to master content and to extend their investigations, to become more self-directed and to assume greater control over their learning. So now the question, what is meta literacy? It is a pedagogical model for thinking and knowing and um, a redefinition and reinvention of traditional and definitions of information literacy. And the prefix meta refers to metacognition to encourage learners to reflect on their own knowing, um, I mean thinking. Um, so what learners think about their own thinking um, yeah, a reflective understanding of how and why they learn, what they do and what they don't um, know, and how to continue to learn. And there's also a second meaning for meta, 
derived from the Greek. Meta means after. This me means meta literacy is that which is required after or beyond the basic skills of reading and writing. Um, and in meta literacy, which is an integrated model, there are characteristics, domains, roles, goals, and learning objectives that spurs uh, the development of the uh, meta literate learner. So here you can see the meta literate um, learner characteristics. And um, the characteristics of the metaphoric learner define the essential qualities that the individual possesses and strives to achieve and practice um, through meta literacy. So here are eight of them. Now to the four domains of meta literate learning. Um, so information literacy emphasized the cognitive and behavioral aspects. You can see that here on the right side. Um, and meta literacy added two additional domains, the metacognitive and the effective. I already explained what metacognitive is. And effective means, um, for example, how we feel about an issue. So it refers to how we feel after a particular learning activity. Now to the meta literate learner roles. So meta literacy provides a comprehensive view of the individual by encompassing four domains of learning that separately and in tandem inform multiple learner roles. Um, individuals can take on roles to varying degrees and through the application of the four domains and the related activities to learn meta literacy, um, it strengthens or develops the responsibility. So in the blue circle, you can see the meta literate learner roles. Now to the goals and the learning objectives. The um, they um, and the meta literacy goals and learning objectives they um, informed by the learning domains, and they are pivotal to this um, ongoing learning process. So you can see here four of them, and each of um, um, the goal has um, their own learning objectives. For example, to recognize expertise and to check the legitimacy of content and sources or um, to ethically remix and reuse openly licensed materials um, um, or um, to um, ask learners to see themselves as producers of information or um, to emphasize learning as a, le a lifelong process and learning from mistakes. And um, if open online learning environments are based on the named meta literacy model, it can offer significant uh, potential to develop self-directed global um, learners. However, um, intercultural aspects must be taken into account. So I will go on with the presentation of the Metro Literacy Badging System. So with the development of OIR, which are open educational resources, there's been a drastic change in teaching and learning. So open educa uh, education initiatives aim to change the structures themselves, as well as the relationships among the main actors like learners or teachers or any educational institution to create equity which all in all leads to new learning opportunities. So open meta literacy resources have also been developed. They can be used anywhere and at any stage of life where people have different interests and focuses. And because of the advantages of the open access uh, to learning and the independence from the location, the meta literacy badging system was developed as Jacobson mentioned in his text, a first draft already existed in 2012. And um, next slide, please. Thank you. And here we have a graphical representation of the badge system. You can see which individual badges or competences can be acquired. These are producer and collaborator, master evaluator, empowered learner or digital citizen. So as you see, there is a lot of possibilities uh, to work in different areas. So the system therefore has a flexible design to meet the specific needs or to be adapted to the specific needs of the learners. 
So it works by having learners create their own learning content. They can present it to their classmates. And in addition, they have the opportunity to assess it from others. The advantages of this type of learning are the promotion of active co-creation and also self-reflection, which obviously goes beyond the usual skills you can acquire in class. Yeah, um, further, the article we read by Jacobson is discussing two badges and their impacts in more detail. There has been put a particular emphasis to integrate the digital citizen badge and the resources this badge entails in the education programs for students who want to become teachers. Um, this will have beneficial results for teaching primary and secondary school learners in their meta literate competencies. Uh, the other badge that is highlighted is the Empowered Self-Directed Learner Badge. For this badge, the metacognitive competence of self-reflective behavior has to be shaped and trained, especially with regards to past learning experiences. So the introspection of one's own learning past and reflection on the behavior of fellow learners. Um, to the opportunities and challenges of the badging system, with, uh, with regards to the challenging aspects, the article refers to technology and logistics. Here, we especially, uh, here especially important is um, the fact of access. So those discussed models are only available to people who have the general resources. So only people who already have the opportunities of being educated, those who have access to computers and the internet. Um, to the opportunities, um, the badging system allows new forms of learning, promoting autonomous learning environments. The article promotes a potential solution for future um, customized learning pathways. Therefore, the aspect of gamification is highlighted. So can, comparing teaching and learning improvements between peers and teachers, visualizing progress as motivational factors. Um, further, they emphasize on the fact that there is no success without um, instructional support. So we need instructions and autonomy, and that guarantees us uh, learner success. So next we will cover the multilingual and multicultural aspects of IL. And these two umbrella terms are interdisciplinary based and they cover a, a variety of situations and issues. And um, IL is promoted to linguistically and culturally diverse groups. And in this area, um, I, IL can be considered as a contextually based experience in a specific cultural context, as well as a cross-cultural difference through self and social consciousness. And concerning the IL models, um, it's not sufficient to adapt only one model for dealing with issues of IL in multicultural and cross-cultural settings. So there's an adaptation required. Um, I need the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. The multilingual approaches to IL are uh, increasing on different levels through various projects. Um, an example being the Erasmus Plus project of a gamification method concerning the transformation of IL instruction in a university environment with a mul multilingual interface with four English languages being involved. Um, and the emphasis is on the importance of the benefit that different language groups derive from different approaches to learning itself. And IL in context of linguistically and diverse student groups um, is concerning the social and educational challenges at different levels that students experience. And therefore an individual adaptation of IL is necessary for diverse cultural communities. Yeah, there are six current issues in the way IL instruction has been delivered, which have implications for the multicultural context. You can see them on the right, and I will present them very briefly. The first one is individuals and groups. Information behavior is a huge individual, but some cultural backgrounds may respond better to a collective rather than an individual approach. The second issue is content of IL instruction. The content of an IL program is likely to be invariant to language and culture. So it is the examples which are used and the details of the content that need to be adapted. 
The third issue is specific and generic IL. IL provision has to strike a balance between specific and generic content and good practice is regarded as the creation of a set of generic models and materials which can be modified, customized or extended for use in culturally specific context. The next issue is IL models. There are various models for IL and the general view is that the newer, more holistic and flexible models may be more suitable, but no model does uh, full justice to the complexities of the multilingual and multi multicultural context yet. Another issue is the pedagogical models. The most widely used pedagogical model is uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, but the taxonomy is not suitable as a pattern for understanding learning in all cultural settings. So it would be desirable to look for alternatives to bloom in multicultural contexts or at least to reflect on its limitations. And yeah, the last issue is gamification. There has been little use of games and IL instruction with a multilingual or multicultural nature. And in a multicultural context, the game approach should at least be optional, as some uh, could find the game elements confusing or troubling. Next slide. Yeah, so all in all, there's a general agreement that the develop development of IL in all contexts should be sensitive to issues of language and culture. And several of the main information literacy models are applicable to multicultural aspects, but none of them are fully satisfactory. And models such as meta literacy, for example, seem flexible enough, but do not address the issues in multilingual and multicultural contexts directly. So more examples and best practices are urgently required because there's a huge and growing need for multilingual and multicultural information literacy. Yeah. Then yeah, our references and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, just ask. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess <clears throat> these are important foundations for our learning endeavor. A few years back, we we started um, at two locations. Later on, Tom McKee and Rudy Jacobson joined us, and they brought in this meta literacy perspective which is very, I would say, capable to cover the learning related things of um, information literacy and intercultural aspects. I guess this is something we will experience and explore in the course. And according to my knowledge, prove me wrong, there is not much research with regard to that. Uh, there are a lot of papers of information behavior of migrants but much less research on bringing groups from different um, parts of the world together for a common learning purpose. Ms. Zelitsky, we see you, but it's rather blurred. <laughs> yes, my camera is a bit damaged, so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe the other crew members can shortly activate their cameras too, so that we at least see you once. A bit social presence would be nice. I'm sorry, mine is not working. <laughs> Some cases, finally. <laughs> okay, any questions, remarks from the audience here? Does not seem to be the case for the moment. Group A, thank you very much. Group B. Raise your hands. Raise your hand so that the operators here can, can give you their, their rights. And I hand over moderation to Stefan Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So group B um, would then continue with a similar topic, but more an applied issue regarding information and meta literacy. So um, yeah, please group B again, raise your hands and so that you can get the presentation rights. 
And yeah, as soon as this is working, um, please also try to switch on your camera if this would work and to share your screen so we can see your presentation. Okay, perfect. So um, in this case, uh, please start. Um, I don't see it on the screen yet. Oh, yes. So <laughs> here we can see you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay, perfect. So we can see you. Um, the floor is yours. Please start with your presentation. We are looking forward to it. Okay, so uh, we will present some literature on current issues of information literacy. Uh, we have two studies, and uh, first of all, we will introduce both of them. Then we will go over the methods and then present the findings. And in the end, we will make a short summary and conclusion for both of them. Okay. Yes. Um I hope you can hear me. Um, the first study is titled Deconstructing Information Literacy Discourse, Peeling Back the Layers in Higher Education. Um, the purpose of the study is to interrogate um, um, institutional approaches to the practice of information literacy within the higher education sector. And the study is based on the following two research questions. Firstly, how does the discourse of information literacy in higher education practice um, um, in as it is practice in professional guidelines, models, and texts? And the second um, question, how does the discourse of information literacy in higher education position learners in professional guideline models and texts? And um, to answer these um, research questions and discourse analytical approaches used to identify and interrogate discourses related to information literacy and learners from within higher education focused professional text. And um, the um, research is um, conducted on um, preambles to four English language information literacy models and also 16 textbook introductions that investigate one of the studied literacy, model, literacy models. Yeah. And um, the analysis primarily um, reveals that within higher education, information literacy is shaped by two conflicting narratives. On the one hand, we have the outward facing narrative um, where information literacy is, put, is considered considered as an empowering practice, which provides learners with knowledge and skills needed within complex and fast paced information environments. And on the other hand, we have the inward facing narrative where learners are positioned as incompetent and unable to operate within higher education because of missing experience and motivation to learn and fulfill the rules of academic practice. And with regard um, to the first research question, there, um, uh, these central findings implies that um, information literacy is um, considered to be both practicized and agile and practicized um, is, as a practicized information literacy is characterized as timeless and generic shape of information activities, a set of fixed and core skills and abilities underpinning student learning, as well as um, something that is mastered progressively. And agile information literacy is um, characterized as a transferable, transformative and reflect reflective practice, which focuses on critical thinking and openness towards the um, fast pacing um, information ecosystem. And their information literacy is um, considered something that is a shared responsibility. Um, and um, yeah, and both of these um, themes um, um, constitute the concept of empowerment where um, um, learners are empowered with the skills and attitudes, behaviors and understandings needed to make appropriate and informed decisions. 
with regard to the second um, research um, question, um, how are learners in higher education posi positioned by the information literacy discourse? The analysis uh, stated that um, the learner is overwhelmed because of an oversaturated information ecosystem. Um, this leads to passiveness of the um, learner because the information overload produces learners who are not willing to engage with information literacy concepts. Furthermore, they are considered as uncritical because the student passivi passivity positions them as uncritical of information sources. And lastly, they are also described as plagiarists because the students lack an understanding of the ethical use of information. And um, the discussion um, of the paper highlighted some conceptual problems of the empowerment as a result of the conflicting narratives. Um, I will briefly touch uh, on a few. Um, from an information literacy viewpoint, empowerment cannot be equated with the uh, liberatory anti-oppressive origins of the term. Um, instead, the predication of empowerment um, on what students are um, perceived to be lacking um, establishes an intellectual and morally distinction between enlightened and uh, unenlightened uh, students. And consequently, empowerment becomes um, reframed as a form of top-down behavior modification where learners are positioned as irrational and not trustworthy in, in their decision-making. But with this focus on the human deficiency, um, there is that is limiting the scope of information literacy's empowerment um, narrative um, by locating the problem in behavior in the behavior of individuals rather than um, material and so, uh, social um, conditions. And furthermore, empowerment narratives often are assumed as something positive and human centered, um, where human agency helps people um, to. Um, make better decisions, but if this is a uh, achievement of freedom is achieved through correction of the behavior, this results in a shifting of the priority um, to changing individu individual's reasoning rather than addressing institutional interests. Okay, um, now I would like to talk about the second study. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, the, um, yeah, one uh, slide. Okay. Um, <laughs> the um, research method was, um, uh, no, I need the introduction, sorry. <laughs> um, ah, yeah. Okay, okay so. perfect. Um, yes, the purpose of the study was um, to explore the information literacy skills and the behaviors of the LIS students across the various countries and to examine the potential differences um, as those are important um, for their future professional roles. And um, uh, the research question in this second survey was what strategical um, strategies and sources do LIS students employ when gathering information uh, for course-related information needs? And are the differences in the information-seeking behaviors of the LIS students, uh, are the differences in the information-seeking behaviors of the LIS students in the different countries? And um, the research method uh, which was used uh, was the usage of the second part of uh, so-called PIL survey um, to investigate the LIS students' information behavior regarding the course-related assignments. And uh, so it was a survey and um, uh, the sample consisted of 1,249 undergraduate and graduate LIS students from 18 different countries. Um, and we had a varying response rates here um, to the web survey, uh, which was varying per country. And uh, methodological limitations were um, that it was self-reported data. So there was a certain lack of um, reliability and validity within the answers. And then also um, only 13 out of 18 countries um, were European. So we also had a limited geographic scope here. Okay, so now to the first. 
Um, and first of all, regarding <laughs> starting. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> Well, I'm uh, can you hear me or not? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, regarding starting course related assignments and searching for resources, um, the findings here is that uh, pre research work is more difficult than the tasks related to finding and evaluating resources. And um, uh, yeah. Um, such as getting started on the assignment and defining and narrowing down a topic, uh, which appear to be difficult for the students. And also in some countries, uh, evaluating uh, web sources is reported to be difficult. So the implications for LRS uh, programs would be to have more instruction on context gathering, um, to incorporate uh, web evaluation exercises into courses, but also to practice uh, search techniques. Um, the second uh, part, which is preparing course-related assignments. And here the most difficult tasks seem to be rephrasing well-expressed information and uh, knowing whether the student has done a good job with the assignment. And um, also in some countries uh, determining what constitutes plagiarism and knowing when to cite sources. Uh, so um, the implications would be to put a greater focus on citation and how to avoid plagiarism in the curriculum. Um, the third part was how um, the students consulted people and resources and the most widely consulted resources are search engines followed by course readings, library catalogs, Wikipedia, uh, library shelves and research databases. And uh, for people, it was classmates and uh, instructors and also sometimes from friends and family, but uh, rarely librarians. And um, the implications here would be to incorporate the use of databases into courses and also to encourage students to consult with academic librarians. Um, the fourth part was uh, evaluating resources. Um, so regarding library resources, the students used the, um, as a most important criterion was whether a resource was written in the student's native language followed by how current the source is and whether an instructor mentioned it. And for web resources, um, it was the same criteria, but also uh, some other criteria uh, were considered by the students. Um, and the implications here would be to teach students to consider other criteria, such as who published the information and whether an academic librarian uh, would recommend the source. Yeah. And now to the summary and conclusion. Yes, regarding the first model, the authors um, um, stated that information literacy models that are currently existing, existing are outdated. The higher education narratives um, cannot accommodate sufficient learning experience that students bring to their information practices. And authors of preambles, guidelines, etc. need to recognize that current um, positioning creates um, a specific epistemological um, conditions having the potential to marginalize the learners rather to uh, empower them. And the findings from this research should feed into the revision of information literacy models. Yeah. And uh, in the second study, which was about information behaviors and information literacy skills of LIS students from an international perspective. Um, we, uh, it was found out that overall the information seeking behaviors of L LIS students uh, seems to be quite similar to the general population, which might raise a concern regarding the future as a professional librarians. And this is the reason why LIS faculties should definitely consider adapting their curriculum to meet the needs of their students. And also um, some patterns of information literacy skills and behaviors appear to be common to LIS students in general, but others showed significant variance by country. Um, for example, it was hard for them to estimate their own um, ability of information literacy. And um, this is the reason why LIS faculties need to be aware of these differences, uh, intercultural differences, and to uh, support international students who might lack like in certain areas of IL. 
uh, these are our references and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you group two for your presentation. Are there any immediate questions to the group? Otherwise, I think also looking at the time, I think we can immediately discuss, continue with group three. So thank you very much again um, for bringing in also current issues. And you saw already, also we had uh, quite a focus also on the aspect of multicultural aspects. This is also very important for our teaching and the especially when we make work with different groups from different countries and languages. Um, so thank you again. And I would now ask group three, to again raise the hands so you can take over with the presentation. And I don't know. To, okay, so um, then I will also continue with um, this group with the moderation. So please, like before. So, um, yeah, as said at the beginning, this group will now focus on the creation of open educational resources. So now, after having the um, foundations. We will now go more into the um, practical implementation and later on um, we will go then even with real practical examples with our local groups here. Okay, I've seen the um, symbol that it looks um, there are groups already. So please then in this case to the technical team, please also share this share the screen. Okay, great. So we can see the presentation. Um, if you can, you can also switch on your camera. And now we lost few of the presentation. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear very well. Perfect. Okay. And now we can also see your presentation. Okay, it looks pretty good. So um, we would be ready to go and please the floor would be yours. Okay, uh, our presentation uh, is about the introduction to open educational resources. And for this, we will first um, speak about the definition of open uh, educational resources. Then we will um, talk about the uh, five R's and the advantages of them. Then we speak uh, about the challenges and how to use um, open education um, resources. And at the end, we'll um, speak about the uh, seven licenses. Open educational resources are educational materials of uh, any kind and in any medium that are released uh, under an open license. Such a license allows um, people to um, access, use, process, and edit um, contents for free. Open educational resources can include individual materials, but also complete uh, courses or books. And any medium can be used. Um, like course materials, textbooks, streaming videos, um, multimedia applications, podcasts, and all these resources are open educational resources when they are released um, under an open license. When using uh, OER, the following uh, five keys, uh, five key points should be considered. Uh, first uh, is reuse. It's uh, the right to reuse the content in different ways. For example, uh, when you use it in study groups. Uh, the second is um, retain, the right to create, own, and control uh, co copies on, um, of the content. For example, downloads. The third is revise, the right to adapt, modify, or challenge the content. For example, when we uh, translate the text from English to German. The fourth is remix, the right to combine the original or revised content with other open contents to uh, create something new. For example, um, incorporating images and videos into a video. 
And the fifth is um, redistribute is the right to share copies of the original edited or mixed content with others. Uh, for example, when I send um, copies of the content to my friends. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, now we will come to the advantages of, uh, of open educational resources. And uh, the just mentioned five R's also play a major role in the advantages of OERs. And uh, the reuse um, gives uh, the, wait a moment. <laughs> gives the uh, access to everyone to download and uh, to read OERs. And uh, this ensures, among other things, uh, equal opportunities. And also many search engines uh, allow a targeted search for OERs. Um, the revise uh, can, uh, is for the OERs can be adjusted in language and regional characteristics such as uh, currencies uh, and units of measurements, etc. Um, the remix uh, is like uh, missing topics from other textbooks can be inserted and uh, this combines several resources with each other and uh, this enables new approaches to collaboration. And um, this form of exchange and reuse saves uh, many time, much time. Uh, the redistribute is um, the newly created textbook can be published. And uh, OERs support new methods like uh, the flipped classroom, the individualized learning paths and uh, materials and an open teaching learning culture. So I will continue with the challenges of the open educational resources. And at first we have the quality aspect. So the material can be edited by everyone and this will lead to irrelevant or inaccurate information. And I guess we all know this aspect from several um, Wikipedia websites. So uh, the second one will be the limitation of copyright and the copyright protection changed from all rights are served to um, some rights are served. So that means for the authors, they must be intentional about their um, own content. So the third issue is the technology issue. So not everyone has a fast internet connection and not everyone can use the um, software that is presented. And the fourth one is the language. The primary language of the open educational resources is English, but not everyone can speak English. That can lead to another problem. And then we have the educational institutions and they can limit the learning, teaching and the research of this material. Okay, so how to use OER? Um, OER systems are used in educational context which can be described as so-called uh, open educational practices. And this form of education is open, um, is using the open content in the OER and also focuses the network and learners connection within this. And the use of OER in educational context is defined as a set of activities around instructional design, implementation of events and processes intended to support learning, especially in different contexts. So in relation to the challenges of OER, how can I use the system successfully? Uh, first, it is recommended to create a knowledge how OER works so that I can uh, evaluate the quality of an OER system. And uh, this knowledge must be kept up to date to develop, select, modify, and localize OER effectively. Um, furthermore, I have to look which OER systems um, exist and use the existing content, uh, modify and create a context to respond to the different learning needs of students. Um, and the good way to continuous improvement is to ask for feedback to improve the quality and set the focus on learner. 
And moreover, you have to know about the types of license, uh, which will be shown in our next in the next step of uh, our presentation. <laughs> So I will continue now with the license of the open educational resources. And this one is named Creative Commons, also known as CC. And CC allows creators to use the work or content made by others by copying, disturbing, or changing them. And there are seven different licenses you can see on our slide. And I will shortly present them now. First, we have the public domain. There is no copyright at all. So the work is not, um, okay, sorry. So there, there's no copyright, right? <laughs> so the second one is CC BY. That means that um, you can copy, publish, modify, or change the license, but you have to um, name the original um, creator. The second one is, um, um, this one is uh, CC by SA, so you also have to name the original um, creator. It's like CC by, but um, you don't have to change the license. Then we have CC by ND. There is a modifying forbidden, and you also have to name the um, original creator. Then we have CC by NC. This one means that you cannot use the um, content for commercial use. Then we have CC uh, by NCSA. And this one means that commercial um, use is forbidden and you are not allowed to change the license. And the last one is CC by NCND. And this one means that you are not allowed to um, use the content for commercial use and the modifying is also forbidden. Yes, thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, you can ask us. And on the next slide, you will see our references. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any immediate questions to the group? Otherwise, as before, looking at the time, I would say we will continue with the program. So thank you very much to all the groups in Germany for join, joining in today, for sharing your presentations. This were very interesting insights into your work. And we would be also very happy if you will still stay online and watch us in the remaining session, where we will now come to the groups that are here in presence. And for this part, I will hand over again to Joachim Griesbaum to moderate the next part. Mr. Kriesbaum will hand over to Ms. Adilovic. Uh, for moderation, um, she said, just a second, group climate, climate change, please also enter the stage. Oops, sorry. You like you can take the seats here. Yeah. <laughs> As you wish. So, uh, Thank you, uh, uh, German students. Now we continue with this uh, live sessions here. Uh, first group um, took a theme, uh, climate change. Uh, obviously, Janeta will be the presenter. So Janeta, the floor is yours. Continue, please. Uh, yes. Uh, no, longer. Now? OK. Um, yeah, it's not just going to be me. It's also <laughs> going to be these three wonderful people too. <laughs> um, but I'm going to um, do the first part of the infographic if you're going to turn it on uh, or not. Oh, um, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Thank you. 
Uh, so we started our infographic with a very uh, general question that we all ask ourselves and we research, which is keywords. Um, every database that we enter, every Google search that we do, we think of keywords. So if somebody who's going to use this resource is going to approach um, the subject in that matter, they're going to think, oh, let's let me Google climate change or let me search on that database with the term climate change. But climate change is not um, it's uh, all encompassing term from an, for another glossary of different terms. Um, it's a certain terminology. There's a certain vocabulary that contains uh, that's uh, specific for climate change. And that's the terminology of that. So when we say um, Googling or searching for climate change, we also have to keep in mind the other different terms like global warming, climate crisis, climate breakdown, and environmental destruction. So there's a obvious um, kind of grading to these terms. Um, and when we think of how we use them and why we use them, we might think, oh, well, um, you know, reading an article that contains climate change, it's very mellow saying climate change. If it contains climate crisis, the word crisis might make us a bit more concerned. You know, it's like it's not the same when we say, oh, it's an accident or it's a catastrophe. But those two are not synonyms or shouldn't be treated as like synonyms. And in this general sense, uh, when we say, for example, environmental destruction, that sounds very um, like the evil plan of a supervillain. It sounds very dramatic. So when we read this, we need to think of how we understand this term and how we react to it, both intellectually and emotionally, and how we engage with it. Could I ask just for a bit of a scroll? I don't know who is doing that. A little bit. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we need to think of how we how people engage with those terms. Do is reading something that dramatic gonna turn somebody off from researching further because it sounds so catastrophic, so scary, basically? And what I found by uh, trying to kind of lead the people who might see this infographic and wonder, well, what do I do next? I now know all the terms. Where do I search? What what can I find? So I found the following resources. I'm gonna go to the first three ones kind of quickly because the last one is what I want to hold a pause because it's more interesting. The first one is where you can find relevant studies. That's natural, uh, national academies to view news articles and press releases as UN news and to learn about the current state of the climate. That's CSIRO. Uh, but the last one to check the latest climate, uh, lights, yeah, climate cl pardon, claims is climate feedback. It's a very interesting website. It's a nonprofit organization. They do um, they cooperate with the international fact checker network and use the tool uh, Hypothesis, which is a web annotation tool that offers all the people using it uh, to be able to uh, collectively annotate certain articles if they want to later check them for false or um, factual claims. And they do call themselves a website that uh, separates fact from fiction regarding climate change so it is a very interesting um web page that i could that i would uh, recommend to users who are wondering well i read something where can i check if this is um correct but it's so specific it's about climate change so it has everything from podcasts to what you might hear um it has articles journals um news um different all sorts of different sources that you can check uh, they are a team of um, scientists. They all, as far as I understood, they are PhD scientists who um, are who formed a um, collective network, uh, and they all uh, had to. Uh, they all check. I mean, the page checks if they have published peer-reviewed articles in top-tier journals regarding climate change. So to see whether they are, you know, whether they should have any say in this matter, and. I'm gonna hold it on this part and I'm gonna hand over to my next partner, Corina, who's gonna say more things. That's fine. So maybe we can scroll down a little bit. A little bit more. Yeah, we not only wanted to um, give some sources, but furthermore, we wanted to give like some assistance for people who are looking up for some sources by themselves. 
So we gave, uh, we added like the so-called a crab method. Mm -hmm. It focuses on five criteria like currency, purpose, relevance, authority, and accuracy. And so the user uh, can check by themselves is the source I found maybe reliable. So we have some um, examples. For example, they can ask themselves, okay, does the data affect the content or the context or was it updated? Is it a current source? And so it's not only for the, our topic climate change, you can use it for any specific, uh, any um, further topic, but for our target group, um, people who are that have not that much knowledge about the topic, I think it's a very good starting point. I think we can, yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Oh, mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, noisy. Um, yeah. Um, Dobadan, moin zusammen. My name is Haris. Uh, can you go on the top or uh, on the bottom? Yes, thanks. Uh, I will show you seven types of mis and disinformation. Let's start with a satire or parody. Um, it is explained to no intention to cause harm but has potential to fool. We have an example, uh, especially for the theme uh, climate change. So we are happy to announce that the CO2 emissions of the factory have already increased again. Um, let's go to the second one. It's like misleading content, misleading use of information to frame an issue or individual. Um, there we have another example for um, Especially uh, the brand uh, climate neutral can be misleading without uh, clarification. The next one is false connection. When headlines, visuals or captions don't support the content. And uh, the example for this is exaggerated earthquake headlines or visuals. Can we go down a little bit, please? So the next one is imposter content when genuine sources are impersonated. So there can be fake accounts on social media, which is spreading fake facts about global warming. It's we uh, we took the definition. It's not fake. It's false. False is a little bit better. So go ahead, please. Thank you. Then we have false context. Uh, when genuine content is shared with false contextual information, there we have an uh, example um, from the States. It's like the Oregon, Oregon petition. And at this petition, um, there were over 30 scientists signed a petition claiming that global warming does not exist. But I think uh, they were only 37. And uh, the last one, fabricated, fabricated content, content uh, which is 100% false, designed to deceive and do harm. And uh, the example is temperature measurements that have been wrongly uh, measured for decades and have therefore drawn the, drawn the wrong conclusions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Mikhail and I will, I will present you the part uh, about Toxic 10. Uh, Toxic 10 is actually a study uh, sponsored by United Nations and conducted by the, just a second, uh, the, the Center for Countering Hate, a non-profit and non-governmental organization uh, supported by the UN by the UN, which deals with contrary digital hate and this disinformation on on the internet and the main goal of, uh, the main goal of research uh, which covered period from october 2020 till october 2000, 2021 was the indicate which media organization are most responsible for spreading manipulative manipulative content about global warming and other aspects of climate change on the internet. And the results of the research show that only 10 media, most from USA and Russia, are responsible for spreading about 70% of uh, digital climate change denial. 
and mostly of them from Facebook. So we believe that these facts will help internet users about climate change, misinformation, disinformation, false or true concept, and also guide them to further research. Actually, users can find can find above link about full full report. And uh, but uh, some of these media are famous worldwide. So some of them from Russia, Russia Today, is Sputnik, and New, uh, Newsmax from US. And uh, also, I think it's it's important to say that only eight percent of the content from these ten media uh, was marked as as false by by Facebook. And also 90, 99% of users interaction with posts containing toxic, toxic 10 content were with posts without information or fact checking labels. A uh, big point of these topics is also influence. Um, the research showed that these 10 media has a big influence and achieved more than 1 billion visits in last six months and also they followed by uh, 186 million users on social networks like facebook youtube twitter and telegram that kind of stuff but most uh, important thing is part of uh, sponsors and financial things uh, they they five out of ten media are financed and sponsored by gas or oil uh, company like ExxonMobil, like uh, like uh, Gazprom, while uh, um, Russia today is putting also financed by and supported by Russia government. So we we thinking that we thinking that this kind of questionable contact from this media uh, contribute co contribute to confuse uh, social consu consumers of social network. And uh, when it comes to understanding uh, the climate change, the debate. So that's uh -huh. so we have also simple steps can have a large impact. So some basic things about what we can do to change uh, climate perspective. So that's we know that's basic stuff, but uh, just do it. <laughs> We are finished. Thank you. Thank you, Group One. You did a really good work. Uh, do you uh, hear or um, our uh, panelists attendees at Zoom? Do you have any questions for the Group One? One second, two seconds, three seconds. <laughs> okay, no questions. One more second. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, now I want to ask Hannah, uh, our uh, instructor, do you want to join us here in uh, moderating this? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... For our next topic, um, we'll have um, the group on COVID-19. Um, uh, yeah, so you might already um, join us here. Um, actually, when uh, giving out the topics, we had the discussion whether COVID-19 would be over or not. Um, but I think uh, these informations are nevertheless um, quite interesting, especially for people that are um, not so well informed on the topic uh, than we might be. So yeah, please. Um, hi everyone. My name is Sarah. This is Vivian, and this is Anna. And uh, we will welcome you to our presentation for an OER on how to conduct research um, through the on the topic of uh, COVID nineteen. Um, can you scroll down a bit so we can see the introduction? The introduction has. Just scroll down a little bit, a little bit. 
Okay, thanks. Um, the end of 2019 marks the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic on unknown disease an unknown disease spreading quickly, thus the need for information increased alongside the need for guidance. Um, disinformation and conspiracy theories were quickly spread by individuals that had no background in the medical field. And hence, there was an infodemic, the phenomenon of too much information containing false or misleading statements. So we would like to uh, provide guidelines on how to conduct a research on uh, the example of COVID-19. And this guideline can be applied to almost any topic, um, as well as difficult topics in the field of medicine and science. And it's just a template that you can modify to your preferences as soon as you um, gain more knowledge about the way how to conduct research. Um, yes. On the topic of COVID-19, we have a small overview of authorized resources that can be found both for the need um, for international information by the World Health Organization, as well as information regarding your country and in your language by national authorities of your country. And the examples that we have listed, oh, you, you have to scroll down a bit, <laughs> where to find trustworthy information. Yes, perfect. Um, and our examples um, for Germany are the Robert Koch Institute, the RKI, and for Croatia, it's the HZJZ, and for Montenegro, it's the IZJZ. Um, now, I will hand over the microphone to Vivian. Um, could you scroll down a bit, please? Thank you. So um, we also thought that it's important to tell our target audience uh, how to evaluate information. So um, we provided seven steps. And the first one is um, to check for previous work and make sure to find a fact-checked fact resource. The second one is that uh, you should find the original source because most of the time content on the internet is not original. Um, the third one is that uh, you should check the name of the author because anonymity can indicate that the paper is fake. Um, then the next step, um, we thought that you should find out what other authors say about the information. Um, for the fifth step, it's also important that um, you find at least three independent resources, not only one. Um, the sixth step is that you should check if it's funded because funded papers may indicate hidden advertising and biases. And the last one, um, we thought that it's also important to go back and check your gained knowledge again. And Okay, so the third part of uh, our poster is how to identify and convent uh, media manipulation. Uh, we separate it into, let's say, three groups, uh, fake news, disinformation, and fact manipulation. So uh, first, fake news. Um, it doesn't have to uh, be based exclusively uh, on false information, but uh, only one part of uh, of uh, uh, of it can be made up, uh, and the rest of uh, and the rest of the content can be um, can be uh, accurate or factually uh, neutral. Uh, but we are witnessing that uh, most of uh, online portals are just for the clickbaits uh, ma making up. So it's maybe similar uh, and to the conspiracy theories. Uh, the second one is disinformation. It's kind of a milder form of fake news, uh, and it's often connected with unverified information, uh, manipulation of facts, uh, based uh, reporting, and other forms of manipulation. And the third one is fact manipulation. Uh, it's kind of uh, just to put it here, it's <laughs> uh, it's similar to disinformation, but uh, this is the case when a media re a media report uh, interprets uh, the facts in misleading in, in misleading way, and they are trying to lead uh, readers to wrong conclusion. Uh, for instance, we have uh, some fact that is true, but uh, if you don't know the context, it may you may jump to the wrong conclusion. Yeah, uh, so we decided to visualize those. Uh, terms, groups. Uh, so we have uh, a true example of uh, vaccines. So uh, the fact is that a vaccine in most uh, cases helps prevent the symptoms. Then we have fake news. Uh, vaccine uh, contains a chip that can track your every move. We base it on, um, you probably heard when uh, Bill Gates uh, 
since he's a, a philanthrop, he wanted to fund the pharmacy companies and uh, people just make up made up that uh, he wants to put microchip uh, microchips in our vaccines so he can track us <laughs> etc uh, then uh, this information that everyone has the same reaction to the vaccine well everyone has uh, the uh, direction but uh, it's not the same because everybody is different and vaccine and uh, for fact manipulation is that fact, uh, vaccine makes you immune um, it's um, uh, it makes you immune, but um, you still can get COVID uh, if you're vaccinated. And the last part. Yes. Um, now, um, a small summary of all the things we have said and all the information that was above. Um, we're going to present that. So you just have like a small summary. Um, it's tips and tricks on browsing about COVID-19. And the first tip is how important your... Um, the, your search request is and that you should keep it in the most simplest possible language so that you can get the query that is um, according to the language that you understand, which might be simple language. Um, the second tip is that you shouldn't like only click through pages and you should skim the pages, but also um, not just only read headlines because these headlines without context can be very misleading. And tip number three is to consider if your own beliefs might or could affect your judgment. So you should always try to stay objective. And the last tip would be to consider when the information was published. Since we're talking about science and the medical field, there's more and new information every day and information could be outdated. So always stay, uh, try to stay updated and always look at the date of the source that you're looking at. That is very important. Um, we created this poster to uh, be able to... Um, give information to students that or like to people that don't really know how to conduct research and the poster speaks for itself so um, we wanted the poster to be informative even without this presentation I hope we achieved that um, here we have our resources and we thank you for your attention you have questions <laughs> Okay, I think not. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, so probably Sanel wants to introduce the last group. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then man's apparently up to me again. Um, yes, yeah, so for our last group, um, they had the topic of war in Ukraine, and um, you might already like get to the stage. And as we've already mentioned in the beginning, we had some very vital discussions on this topic. So um, this might be a bit different from the other ones because they're more of a, like a static topic. Um, but yeah, so please. Hello, everybody. My name is Luca. I will be the presenter for my group, and I have my group members are here with Sharia, Eda, and Milan. Sharia and Eda being from Hildesheim, Milan from being from Belgrade, and also we have a group member that's missing, Christina from Pontgorica. I am from Sarajevo. Because I know that we are a short on time, I will try to be as short as possible. As Hannah said, uh, during discussions, we realized that our topic is different from the other topics in a sense that an average user in a sense of uh, having information that have immediate applicability, in a sense when somebody is, gets well informed about uh, climate change or COVID, then they can almost immediately change their behavior towards being more careful about their own health or being more careful about their environment. But in our topic, uh, when somebody gets well informed about Ukrainian war, there is nothing much that an average person can immediately do. So we decided to have the focus on recognizing some negative informational seeking behavior and suggest and make suggestions how somebody can have a better improve their habits of information seeking so they can get uh, a general immunity against possible fake news and missing and disinformation and misinformation on social media so for the first suggestion we wanted to uh, mention that like like a slogan that uh, information seeking uh, has to come from multiple sources as information seeking is more like a, uh, creating a, a, a jigsaw puzzle pieces than 
receiving the whole picture immediately. We didn't put it on the infographic as it was a recent episode, but with the missiles in Poland, we could have seen that while it was ongoing, almost a lot of different news coverages pointed out different stories with, with different countries claiming different things and with things that can be ongoing, a lot of different information can exist at the same time. And so we wanted to, for the first like real suggestion of how about how to evaluate information, we also uh, had our basis on the crap method, but we decided to focus on the currency and also the authority. The, uh, the currency being important as that most people get their information from social media, older news and newer news can exist at the same time. So we wanted to, uh, make make the uh, average person think when seeing when reading something 12 years ago to the uh, time a date and time about when it was posted and also about authority because a war like an, uh, the russia ukrainian war like any war is highly a political topic so there are a lot of information providers can have uh, their own agendas as warfare uh, as warfare isn't always solely military but it can be also information and political so you want to the users to always think about who is a provider of the information they're getting. So they always have to check the impression of the websites. And also because most people get their information from social media and social media has a lot of out of context posts. We didn't want to address that, but we wanted to suggest to the average person, the possibility of having to check pictures and videos through some internet tools that can, that are called either reverse image search or, or video video reverse search and we mentioned a tool like Duple checker and we put it put a link to their website so when somebody sees something on the internet especially on social media they can check they they, they themselves can check if that picture is a current picture or if it was a newer older picture or if it's even tied to the context it was put out in a social media post and for the third suggestion we wanted to uh because it wanted to address that information can be effective especially following the meta literacy domains and with things being effective it's we didn't want to address like to, to treat to make a suggestion if if you if an information or news makes you emotional then it's probably a sensationalism, but we wanted to address that even reliable information can trigger strong emotions. So we wanted to address and mention that, like a suggestion and reading, be conscious of how you feel and then think about what you read and if it's misleading or not. We didn't want to tell people if it's if it if it triggers strong emotions that it's sensationalism, but to acknowledge the fact that even reliable information can trigger strong emotions. And for the last part, we decided to put some examples of fake news, with the first being uh, of a, a video of a tank crashing a car, which was firstly uh, uh, labeled as a Russian tank, but later it was debunked as an Ukrainian tank, as an example of having real footage in a different, and, and the problem of missing information is the context. And the second part was about the social media. I'm not sure if it was viral or not, but a video of a uh, climate demonstration in Wien having been digitally manipulated to have a voiceover of coverage from a Ukrainian war. And it was put on social media, implying that Ukrainians are staging uh, war crimes by Russians. And so that the first example was of a real footage being put in a different context. And the second example was of a digitally manipulated footage claiming to be true. And these are the sources uh, that refer to the website. And also we made sure to put the date because uh, to that, so the reader, because if, if something from our poster gets uh, outdated by the passage of time, they, oh, they, there's a date which can tell in which uh, temporal context it was made. I hope I was quick enough to not hold you longer than the full limit. Uh, thank you, Luca. Uh, before we proceed, uh, Haris wants to say something. Yeah, one uh, last sentence. Uh, in the name of all students who did the workshop, uh, we want to thank uh, Mr. Griesbaum to uh, yes to uh, made uh, which made the uh, or moderate the workshop, etc. Thank you, and also Hannah. We want to thank Amina, especially Amina. She's the greatest. And uh, Mirna, uh, Sanel, 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 thank you.
And uh, yes, I think that is. Thank you. Thank you, Harz, even more because without you, uh, we wouldn't <laughs> be here and our role would not make any sense. Uh, so uh, since this is um, our first offline uh, workshop, we provided certificates for you and we want to give you uh, them now. So uh, we will do it one by one and in the end, uh, group vote. Is that fine? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, no choice. Yes. Should I have like to yeah, we'll stand there. up. Yes, Anna, please. <laughs> um, first is Corina. Where is Corina? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cheria, did I pronounce this? Okay. <laughs> Sarah? Thank you. The next is Eda Chirac. Maurus Anna. Here we go. Uhek Anna Maria. Thank you. Next one is Drashkic Mihailo. Thank you. Uh, Stokanovic Milan. <laughs> Janet Azaklan. <laughs> Luka Boskovic. <laughs> Hvala tebi, Luka. Brkić, Haris. Here you go, Haris. Hvala tebi. Vivian Hampel. Thank you, Vivian. And here we have two students from Montenegro uh, and uh, Christina and Milica left today because they have exams next week. So uh, with a good reason, but we call their professor, uh, Natasha Ružić, to take this certificate. Thank you, Natasha, for sending such great students. Thank you very much for this opportunity and that you invite our students to participate and to improve their knowledge in the area of media literacy. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> so with this ceremony, I think we're uh, done for today. This was also the last uh, session. Yes, Joachim wants to say something also. Or should I close the session? Maybe Thomas or Dave? Yeah. Yeah, thanks everybody, especially at home too, and to the audience here, you're still here, we are long over you, <laughs> and uh, yeah, very special thanks to the students. <clears throat> we started one week, not one week ago, one week ago at home, a few days here, and such a great work, perfect OER, I guess, we, maybe we think about how to spread it to the world, and yeah, thank you very much. Students, really impressive work. Very good. Thank you.
No, not much more to say. So I thank you all for the visit and the participation. See you tomorrow at what time, Emina? At 10 a.m. Yes. Group photo. Now group photo. Group photo. <laughs> and goodbye for the rest of you. See you tomorrow. Yeah, we've got it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.